Coming. From the beginning, nothing seemed more natural than for couples to want to skate together. But it took years for the sport of ice dancing to evolve. It started as a social event. Ladies and their gentlemen danced together much as they would in a ballroom. In fact, by the 1950s, ice dancing closely resembled ballroom dancing. Foxtrots, waltzes, tangos, and rumbas were transferred from dance floor to ice, and many of the compulsory dances were invented then. By 1976, dance became an Olympic sport. This couple, Pakamova and Gorskov of the Soviet Union, helped bring dance into a new, more athletic era. And with the development of new and invented moves, dance shed its ballroom image. And even in the ensuing eight years, dance has come a long way. Jane Torval and Christopher Dean of Great Britain have dominated the sport in the past three years and have moved it in new and original directions. Entertaining, creative, dynamic, Torval and Dean seldom take the ice without something new to unveil. Today we will see the first phase of ice dance competition, the compulsory dances. There are still reminders of that early ballroom era, but all with the modern look that now distinguishes the sport. And now here we are in the Zetra Ice Arena, which you have already seen as the site of hockey competition, ready now for the beginning of ice dancing. The competition takes place in three phases. First, the compulsory dances, which will account for 30% of each couple's final score. On Sunday, the original set pattern dance, which counts for 20%. And Tuesday, one of the most anticipated events of these games, the free dance, which will account for 50% of each couple's final score. Working with me as we follow the ice dancing competition, first, 1968 Olympic gold medalist in ladies figure skating, Peggy Fleming. And Peggy, I've talked about the anticipation which surrounds this event. Of course, it has much to do with the couple which now dominates the sport. Yes, and we're talking about Jane Torval and Christopher Dean of England. And they are the three times world champions, and they have really changed this sport incredibly. They are just stunning on the ice, so creative, and it's just wonderful to watch them. Our uh, competition from the United States is Judy Bloomberg and Michael Siebert. They're four-time national champions, and they're very creative, too. But I think they're going to be in here for, for maybe a medal. But I think Jane and um, Christopher really have this competition kind of sewn up. But they're wonderful to watch. It's exciting. And it will be exciting to watch Torval and Dean, as well as Bloomberg and Siebert of the United States and the others. And, of course, working with us as well as the man whose commentary has done so much to heighten interest in figure skating in the United States, two-time Olympic gold medalist Dick Button. Dick, what to look for in this phase, the compulsory dances? Well, this is the most rigid, precise, and controlled uh, a part of the whole ice dancing scene. Remember, there are three dances. First, the Paso Doble, the Westminster Waltz, and the Rumba. Uh, each of them counts for a total of 10% of the final score. And what they are are dances in the ballroom style, a guy and a girl skating together and having a wonderful time, to particular pieces of music, and the steps are exactly as laid down in the rule book. Mark my word, there is no variation except in a slight amount of flavor. Those steps are exact. They're much like the compulsory figures in the men's and ladies' singles event. And that's what the ice dancing compulsory dances are. Exact, precise, and controlled, but wonderful to look at. And that's what we're going to see in the Paso Doble. And, of course, Dick explained that the first compulsory dance is the Paso Doble. Let's briefly take a look at a diagram which demonstrates its pattern. The dance itself appears to be circular, although the actual pattern is in the shape of a peanut. Each of these little white lines represents steps that the dancers must take, and they represent straight up and down lines, deep edges, cross rolls. You'll see, in fact, some of the cross rolls right here, the little circular lines zinging back and forth, turns, chalk doors, wonderful kind of chasse steps, side-by-side -side steps. What it means is that the dancers are very upright, very straight on some, but have deep edges and deep leans in other steps turns. It's a simple dance, but it's very stylish, and it's a wonderful way to start off the, the compulsory dances in the Olympic Games. The first couple we'll see are now warming up on the ice. Carol Fox and Richard Daly of the United States, runners-up in our national championship five of the past seven years. And earlier, in a conversation with Donna Devarona, they described to us their approach to the Paso Doble. We'll start the competition doing the Paso Doble. Um, in this dance, I tried to be the matador. It's the dance that the matador would do going into the bullfight ring. And he drags his cape along, and throughout the dance, he uh, plays with the bull. And sometimes the matador, the girls, the carol, will be either the bull or the cape at different parts of the dance. The cape. <laughs> so, it's a very commanding, strong dance. It's the male's dance. My and how do you feel about that when you're, when you're out there? 
Well, I think that usually most of the tension is um, female on most other segments of the dances, and so I'm willing to give up this one for... <laughs> give up my strength to the, my matador in this one. But, uh, like you said, it is a very commanding dance, and I think that the female has to be just as sharp and as strong. Carol Fox is 27 years old. Hometown is Westland, Michigan. Richard Daly is 26. His hometown is Detroit. Both of them train under a coach named Ron Ludington in Wilmington, Delaware, as do no fewer than eight of the American skaters in pairs and ice dancing. These are the opening preparatory steps right here. Entry steps. The dance begins. Remember, it's in the shape of a peanut. Almost round, but not quite. Look at these straight scissor steps. Straight up now, deep lean, a curving change of edge, and he does a mohawk. Now the next step, circular, around the end of the ring. Now they lead into a series of cross rolls. Boom, boom, boom. Turns, and isn't it a marvelous, stately kind of marching quality? Very, very stylized. But judges are looking for their unison, how they hold their legs, and their whole body has to be in one line and together. Now these straight scissor steps look straight up, now the deep lean that curves, and then the change of edge. And now these moves around the end of the rink in a circular form. Basically and formally a simple dance, but not easy, because look right here, the curve, the curve, the curve. And the judges are also looking for the flow over the ice to keep that continual movement going. How they point their toes. Every line. Carol Fox and Richard Daly of the United States will be back. You know, Buck and I played on some great teams. That's right, D.D., but now we and the other Light Be All-Stars have done a better one. This team is up against a tough opponent, several palsy, and you can help. For every six-pack of Light Beer Familiar you buy in February, Light will make a donation to United Cerebral Palsy. Look for the display where Light is sold and join the team. If enough of us get together, we can win this one. Right? Right! right. Hey. At AT&T, we think we make the best telephones, but don't take our word for it. Ta-da! We wanted Sharon's new phone to be as good as her sister's. And their phones outlasted 82 boyfriends, six proms, years of yakety yakking, and they're still going strong. To me, there was only one way to get that same quality. Get the same phone at AT&T. AT&T, we set the standards, but don't take our word for it. Take yours. A new design in radial tires is rolling your way from Goodyear. Say hello to Vector. Hello, Vector. Unusual tread you got there. Goodyear's new Vector has a unique tread. Crisscross curves. What are they for? Traction. All season traction in rain and snow. That's what we need up here, Vector. Plus outstanding mileage down the road. Say hello to the new design in radial tires. Vector, sir. Vector. Thank you, Vector. Vector, the new radial design from Goodyear. Now here are the marks for Fox and Dally. For each compulsory dance, there's only one set of marks, and there they are. Five, three, five, two, five, three. There are two five ones. Remember that six denotes a perfect score. Now here they are, 26-year-old Jane Torville, 25-year-old Christopher Dean. They have worked together for eight years for this bid for an expected Olympic gold medal. Now, they're taking their position down at the end of it. Look at how stylishly he holds her hand in the air. Takes his hands on his hips, her hands on her hips. The, the tilt of the head, the line right there, isn't it? I mean, that's sensational. It's just the way they, they take the ice and command it as they do these preparatory steps into the start of the Paso Dobe. They're not starting quite yet now. They're starting right here. Oh, one, two, three. 
Side step, side step. Now look at how straight the scissor step goes. Now the sudden curve and the lean. And the curve again, the change of edge. The mohawk, these steps completing the circle, the bottom of the circle around. Now they prepare to go into the cross rolls. One, two, three. And watch her quick move right at the end of the step. And they start to dance all over again. What is amazing for me is this, con this couple, you're watching the man just as much as the woman. And that's very unusual in ice dancing. The start of the third repetition of the dance right here. Again, the straight chassis, the straight steps, the scissor steps, the curves, the change of edges, and the completion of the overall circle around the bottom as they step here forward to go into those cross rolls again. Now watch each one on an outside clean edge. Very perfect, very precise. They have good strength, strength that comes out of the speed that they have in the dance, the force that they, they get without appearing to apply force to the movement. absolutely fantastic. Jane Torval and Christopher Dean. Now another closer look in slow motion. Okay, let's take a look at this unison that they are so well known for. How close their feet are together and those deep edges that you're seeing. Just beautifully done. And now the scores. Remember that a mark of six represents perfection in this sport and there they are five eight five eight five eight five nine from the british judge five eight five seven from the czechoslovakian judge three more five eight and a good start for torval and dean who will be tough to catch from here on in and next will be the four-time american champions judy bloomberg and michael siebert Earlier, Donna Deverona asked them about the importance of this the Paso Doble to them. Well, I think it's real important to go out with the Paso, which will be the first compulsory that we have to do, and make it consistent, sure, positive, and we are here, and this is our time. Yeah, it's very important to perform it well. It's your first impression. It's the first time they see you outside of the practices, and um, you got to make them make it obvious that you're there to compete and to be the best. It can really set the tone for the competition. And so that's what we're really looking for in that very first dance. We still have two more that rest of that day. Judy Bloomberg is 26 years old, originally from Tarzana, California. Michael Siebert, 24, originally from Washington, Pennsylvania. They live and train in the New York City area now. Hopeful here of a bronze or perhaps even a silver medal. One of the important things to watch there on their pattern is the fleetness of the line, the speed. Just how well they move over the ice and the deepness of the edges, the strength of those edges. That's the strength of Blumberg and Siebert. the curve, the swing roll, right there. Very steady upper body, too. And it's just moving those feet over the, across the ice. Remember, all the dancers are doing exactly the same steps, but they can express with their upper body. Here's the curve, now the cross. And the swing mohawk, stepping backwards. It's just incredibly stylish. were Judy Bloomberg and Michael Siebert of the United States. Perfect. Now a closer look at some of their footwork. Now look at the side stepping here. The Dean, you can see the edging, how strong and how powerfully 
on an edge they are. And here, the cross rolls that they do. Now the swing forward. Look at how crisp it is. And the scores are significantly lower than those which were awarded to Torval and Dean. 5-4, 5-5, 5-5, 5-7. Two more 5-5s, a 5-3 from the Italian judge, 5-6 from the American judge. Hottest selling two plus two in the land, yet priced under eight grand. Price to light your fire. fire. Chevrolet Camaro. Don't leave Earth without it. Chevrolet, official U.S. cars and trucks of the 1984 Winter Olympics. Daddy, apartment, apartment, Daddy. Small, but it's nice. I'll go check on dinner. Oh, uh, I brought you something. Ingle nook. You make me feel special. Well, call it my toast to your independence. Come on, Daddy. You know I'll always need you. And you with wine, England. Can I still call you Squirt? <laughs> from the majesty of the French Alps to the playgrounds of London, from the streets of Paris to the fiery deserts of the Middle East, comes Lace, a tale of loyalty betrayal when it's a senator's word against a sex symbol's word who's going to listen to the senator of love and vengeance i wanted to make each of you suffer now the runaway international bestseller becomes the television event of the year come in from the cold and feel the heat of lace starting february 26th on abc Next up are the two-time Soviet champions, Natalia Bestyamanova and Andrei Bukin, two-time runners-up at the World Championships to Torval and Dean. It's worth noting that both previous Olympic gold medals in this sport were won by Soviet couples, but of course, Torval and Dean are expected to break that pattern this year. They're a very flamboyant couple. You'll watch how they express themselves. She always has fabulous costumes. Even though they're restricted in this dance to the exact steps that are here, they do it with by adding more movement per measure, I think, than any other skater in the business. She has a very unusual extension of her leg. Look at the back. It just seems, gives a nice straight line. It almost bends the other way. That gives a, a very long, long line to their uh, stroke. Steps around the end. The slow continuation of the circle. He steps forward. Now watch the cross rolls. One, two, three, right there. And her final turn right at the very last. That turn must be at the end. If it's any earlier, it's a strict markdown. And the dance starts and repeats itself. Here they come again to the swing right here. And the cross rolls. Now watch her turn right right there with that mohawk. That flare at the end is very typical of their skating, and you'll see more of that in their free dance. On paper choices for the silver medal here, Natalia Beskimanova and Andrei Bukin of the Soviet Union. Okay, here's a slow motion of that extension I was talking about. And watch that leg in the back. It just gives a nice long line right there. That's what the judges are looking for, is that unison, that long, long look and very smooth and the scores five 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 seven five seven five six five seven five six five seven five six and a five four from the american judge now here a young american couple with bright prospects lisa spitz 20 years old from short hills new jersey scott gregory 24 from syracuse new york they train in wilmington delaware this is the all-American couple, if you ever saw one. They are just darling. 
third at our national championships this year behind Bloomberg and Siebert and Fox and Dallas. a great deal of freshness to their skating, a, a kind of American swing in athleticism to, to them, a little bit less stylish than some of the more controlled pairs. very expressive with their head movements. Remember, they all are doing the same basic steps in this dance, but they can express with the upper body to emphasize some of these moves. One thing is hard to believe, quite how athletic and difficult these dances are. Fitz and Gregory of the USA, and as they await their march, let's listen to what they told Donna Deverona earlier about what this experience of being at the Olympics means to them now. Scott, when you think of this experience here in Sarajevo, is this the end, or is it just part of the journey? What do you think? Well, it's part of the journey, and we look at maybe 1988. This is our first Olympics, so we're just going to come and have a good showing. And, um, this is just an experience and education for us, more than anything. Well, if it is that, does that consideration help you put the pressure aside? I mean, like somebody comes yeah. here like Torval and Dean, and everybody expects them to win. Sure. It takes a lot of the pressure off for us. You know, at so. home, everybody says, bring home the gold. But for <laughs> us, you know, that's not realistic, unless everybody ahead of us broke their leg. So we don't really have Our that gold would be pressure. top ten. When you sit down and discuss your performance as a couple, what percentage is technical and what percentage is emotional? I'd say 90, well, 80% is emotional mm -hmm. and 20% is technical. Because it's mind over matter, it really is. Much of the audience here disappointed at the marks for Spitz and Gregory. You see them 5-2, 5-0, 5-2, from the British judge. 5-2, 5-0, 5-1, 5-0, 5-1 from the American judge. A beginning for Lisa Spitz and Scott Gregory. Now here are the official standings after that first compulsory dance. Torval and Dean, the leaders. Bestimanova and Bukin in second place. Blumberg and Siebert in third, exactly according to form. Fox and Dally of the USA in sixth. Lisa Spitz and Scott Gregory are in tenth place. They've taken that first step they wanted toward the top ten finish. Well, you're going to see a lot more of ice dancing, not only in the nights to come, but also all through tonight's program. Ice dancing, certainly the most beautiful, perhaps, sport in the Winter Olympic Games. You're going to see also tonight a very rugged sport, a contrast to ice dancing. It's called biathlon, kind of a simple sounding name, but a very complicated sport. It combines shooting and cross-country skiing. We're going to learn a little bit about the psychology of sport when we see the biathlon coverage, because these men have learned how to lower their pulse count so they can steady their arms for shooting in the shooting phase of that competition. It's very interesting. Also, two-man bobsled. You're going to see the final run for the gold medal coming up next. This is the soft, pure light of the GE soft white bulb. It creates a soft, warm glow that's beautiful to see by and bright enough to work by with less glare and no harsh shadows because its high diffusion coating makes light that's soft, warm, glowing so you can see the world the way you want to see it. The soft white by GE. It puts your life in a better light. GE, we bring good things to life. Tonight, Arnie and I are going out in style in a brand new 1984 Continental Mark 7 from Hertz. For a limited time, Hertz is renting it or any Lincoln for only $39.90 a day. Hey, OJ, our tuxedos just cost me $100. But Arnie, look at this Mark 7 I got us. How much did you pay for this, OJ? Arnie, has anyone ever told you you look great in a tuxedo? The Continental Mark 7 from Hertz. Only $39.90 a day. Offer starts March 15th. In today's hurry-up world, it isn't easy to keep a good driving record. But for those of us who do, Allstate has some good news. <laughs> 
Allstate shape up and save rates and discounts. If you keep your driving record in shape, Allstate could save you money on your car insurance. So drive safely and keep your record shaped up. Allstate will help you keep the cost of your insurance down. Shape up and save. You're in good hands with Allstate. Of necessity, while we're here in Sarajevo, our efforts are pretty much concentrated on the city and the mountains surrounding it. But our cameras before the Olympics and before the blizzard had a chance to see this country. Here are our impressions. It's mankind who has his ups and downs, who behaves erratically on planet Earth. The land stays the same. And the seasons change with regularity, on schedule. Mountaintops, they tell us, grow rounder with the passing centuries and the amount of snowfall will vary from year to year but the lake will sparkle in the summer you can be sure of that and the ancient minaret will glisten in the summer sun and have a frame of snow in the winter Yugoslavia is the kind of land where the regularity of nature and time is very evident a mountainous country a silent country up there Dubrovnik. Some scenes could have taken place in the Middle Ages or even before the Turks came to rule Sarajevo for 400 years and more. But if man is the erratic factor, men and women also give a nation its face and its personality. Adriatic is where Yugoslavia puts on its party clothes and invites the rest of the world to come visit. Yugoslavia, of course, has poor people and traffic and smog, all those things that are visited by mankind upon himself. country hounded by invaders for a thousand years it has more than its share of beauty and that's because of the land which never changes and time which heals wounds and covers scars Now to Mount Trebevich, Bob Sledding, Tim Brandt. As the snow falls and the race to the gold continues here at Trebevich, Wolfgang Hoppe is still in first place, followed by his East German countryman Bernhard Lehmann. The Soviets are third and fourth. Less than a second splits the top four contenders. So the pressure is mounting for the final heat. Wolfgang Hoppe is our leader. Remember, unheralded coming into the games the youngest of the east german drivers having a tremendous olympic performance 5106 was his time after the third heat his brakeman Dietmar Schomerhauer, a former 100 meter sprinter they know they have to have a good run as they come down this hill treacherous with snow it snowed for three straight days the east germans and soviets at the top of the leaderboard an expressionist in sports, when somebody's hot, they're hot. He's hot. He's got a great start time, a great, great through lines through five, six, and seven. Let's watch for a split time here out of seven. See if he's on his game. There's his split time. He's on his game again, Timmy. No doubt this guy is hot as the expression. Through Omega with 576 meters to go. Down into the toughest part of this course. He's perfect the fastest part of the course. He puts that foot any place he wants. Let's watch him in the finish. The final curve, the whip around. He bends for Dare Aerodynamics. His time, 51.06, the same as his third heat time, puts him in first place. Unbelievable consistency to come down this treacherous course in two exact same times. 
That also puts the pressure on the other drivers. They have yet to come down this hill. This is Hoppy in curve nine. He's low. This gives him the chance to put his sled exactly where he wants, sets himself up for the crucial part of the course, which is elaborate. Comes off low, sets himself up coming into the take on. Right here, he's on the corner exactly where he wants to be. Now he's all set for the crucial part of the course. Typical East German consistency. This is Bernhard Lemon, East Germany. He's got a shot at the goal. Well, and he I, knows it. Look I, at his concentration. I tell you, he's got to come down in a sub 51 time to take the gold medal away from his countryman Hoppe. Hoppe just came down at two times, 51.06, 51.06. Consistency. Lehman will do the same. 642, great start. The East Germans do everything so right in this sport. One of the favorites coming in. Now he knows that he's got to drive this course better than anyone has yet. There he goes, off of four. He puts that sled exactly where he wants to be. On the take on early, lower than the cut. Here he goes into six and seven. The brake was tucked perfectly. Out of six, now we go into seven. Instinct, reflex, taking him through double S. Watch for the split time. He's fast, 32.92. He's a little bit slower than last time, considerably. Now into the time-tested curves as we go down to the labyrinth. This is where the drivers with the eye-hand coordination are the best. The grooves are there as they come around the final curve. The cheer comes up to the crowd. He's a little bit high on that curve. His time, 51.36. That'll put him in second place behind Wolfgang Hoppe. His aggregate time, 3.26.04. The East Germans do everything so right. Uh, it's unbelievable to watch him compete in this sport. Bernhard Lehmann, definitely in contention for one of the medals. This is USA number one, the final run for Brent Rushlaw and his brakeman Jimmy Tyler. They don't have a chance for a medal, presently in 15th place. The time they need to take the lead, 47-21, virtually impossible. The fastest time on this track is 51.06, and that's a course record. They get a super heat, though. They can move ahead of a couple Austrians, and the Canadians just barely ahead of them. It's much for split 670. That's normal what he's been getting in the start time. Brent doesn't have the quality sled that the Soviets and the East Germans do, but he's now a pilot. Now he's driving for pride. He's been excellent in the second heat of this competition. Second and fourth heats, he's been very, very good. Let's watch for his foot time here, down out of seven. The only U.S. Bob driver to appear in three straight Olympic games. He will also drive the four-man number one sled. 372, that's 200 better than his last heat, Timmy. Through Omega, he's pulling four Gs as he comes through here. Through curve nine, heading to the labyrinth. Nice line through line, he's got some good, this is the fastest part of the course, he looks nicely clean through here. Rushlow drives the labyrinth as well as any of the drivers in this competition. The final curve through and down, a time of 52.40, a fine time for Brent Rushlow. Yeah, only 500 slower than his previous time, it's very, very consistent, very good for Brent Rushlow. Brent Rushlaw, an outstanding pilot. We'll see him again next weekend in the four-man competition. So these are the standings. The glory goes to East Germany. Wolfgang Hoff is in first place. East Germany number one. Bernhard Lehmann, East German number two. The Soviets yet to come. My friends, Steve and Jenny, will show me a great picture for my book. Some view, isn't it? I could do a book on this alone. That's why we moved here. Coffee's ready, you guys. Maxwell House. Seems wherever folks like good coffee, good to the last drop. It couldn't be anything but Maxwell House. There's a picture for your book, Cal. It couldn't be anything but Maxwell House. It's the president. At AT&T, we never know how important any call will be. Mr. Ryan, the chairman. That's why every product AT&T makes, every business system. It's MGM. Every inch in the millions of miles of our long-distance network. It's Rome. And every single technical innovation is made to handle every call. It's Bobby. As if it were the most important call in the world. Hi. AT&T. We're reaching out in new directions. How are your children coping with stress? Monday on ABC's World News Tonight. This is Giannis Kippers, URS number one. In fourth place after the third heat, this is his last chance. He is trying to catch the East Germans and his own countryman, Sintizik Manis. Now, Kippers was one of the favorites in this competition and had a terrible first heat. Since then, he's come back. So much has been said about these Soviet sleds and their good time that they're possibly dangerous because they're small, but the Soviets have time-tested their sleds. 
Let's go back to 1981. It was the World Cup Championships in Cortina. Inexperienced Soviet drivers were competing in an unfamiliar sport on a treacherous course. This is Yanis Kipur. The Russians crashed often in their first season, suffering embarrassment and bruises in their first international competition. Yanis Kippers, his brake man. Ivar Schneps, mentally getting ready, knowing this is their last chance at a medal. Hey, they have not had the start times we thought they were going to get. We saw them in Innsbruck be 1,500 better than anybody else. They only have the best start times, and this was the best starting team in the world. There was room where they had flu earlier in the week. Maybe that's an effect here. Best start time on the left, 6.40 there, 6.34. Unbelievable start time. That wasn't there in the first team, so let's watch. Oh, he hit there. They have a lot of problems between these quarters, two and three. Giannis Kippers, Linda Sigmanis, yet to come. Uh, he has to have great times through five, six, and seven in order to win this gold medal. Out of seven, he's got to have a sub-33 split time. Let's watch for it. 32-92. 32-90. Down the straightaway into a mega 576 meters to go. Giannis Kippers racing to a medal. Great split time in this heat. He's on it. Fastest part of the course. Around the final whip around, the time on the left, the time he needs, his time on the right, 51-14, puts him in third place. Tremendous time for the Soviet, 51-14, only 800 top, the best time of the day. 3.26-42, the aggregate time for Giannis Kippers. This is Zinta Sikmanis, Soviet Union's number two sled, in prime position for a medal. His countryman, Giannis Kippers, has already gone. Now this is his last chance to beat the East Germans and his own fellow countryman, Giannis Kippers. If he attacks this course like Kippers, he's got a chance. Because Kippers came down at a tremendous time, and we remember Kippers bumped a little bit up top. You know he's thinking about it. You know the pressure is mounted. John, we saw these drivers at Eagles in Innsbruck, Austria. Do you think Ekmanis is a better driver than Kippers? Well, the East Germans had four perfect heats. The Soviets each had one bad heat. I think Ekmanis is going to be on his number right here. He has had spectacular start times, mainly because of Vladimir Alexandrov, his brake man. Now, again, the Soviets are a tremendous starting team. 634 is their teammate. 639 speaks for itself. Now, this is where they have the problems here between quarters two and three. Let's watch for any skids. He's clean, Tim. He's very clean. He's on his number. Trying to get comfortable here before he gets to the extremely tight turns below. A little he bit of trouble coming there. out of there. Yeah, he had the same problem there yesterday. Same problem there yesterday. Watch him at six and seven now. That's going to cost him. Let's watch for a split time out of seven. He needs a sub-33 split time. Let's look for it. 33-01, 32-90. That was his countryman's time on the left. He's behind his countryman considerably. Down into the labyrinth. The tough turn near the end of the course. I don't think he's got a good heat going here at this countryman. He's got to watch out. Had trouble in the final curve. The time on the left is what he needs. His time, 51-26. Puts him in third place. His aggregate time, 326-16. That looks to me it might be the first Soviet medal ever in bobsledding. He knows it. He's got his hands up. And that's considered an upset because Kippers was the favorite of the two Soviets. He beat his countryman, Giannis Kippers, their first Olympic bob appearance, and they know they have got a medal coming at the ceremonies later. But the day really belonged to these two. Wolfgang Hoppe and his brake man, Dietmar Schauerhammer. Hoppe, a spectacular driver, potentially as great as some of the legends of the sport, the likes of Billy Fisk, Eugenio Monti, and Meinhard Neymar. So the final standings in the two-man bobsled competition. East Germany, number two, with a tremendous time of 325.56, takes the gold. Bernhard Lehmann of East Germany is second, and the Soviet Union, Zinta Sigmanis and Vladimir Alexandro win the bronze in their first ever Olympic competition. The United States finished 15th and 17th. We'll be back to Mount Trebevich next Friday and Saturday for the big sleds, the four-man bobsled competition. So for John Morgan, this is Tim Brandt saying so long from Mount Trebevich. It was moving day. Things were going great. Until the moving truck died at the toll booth gate. The troopers were glaring. Tempers were flaring. Do I hear swearing? What more it started to pour? The tow truck came and we gave a cheer. Then the cows slid out the rear. Oh. Now I know rider trucks are newer. They're tougher, they're strong. And driving a bargain sure didn't pay. So next time I'll think this race rider or it's wrong.
I wouldn't be surprised if some of our astute uh, leaders in Washington probably use Skull Bandits. Join the smokers who are switching to Skull Bandits. An individual portion of tobacco in a neat, pre-moistened pouch. It just sits between your gum and your cheek and that's it. You get your good wintergreen flavor and you get your tobacco flavor. The word that describes the Skull Bandit is satisfying. It is pleasurable. As far as an alternative, I'll try the Skull Bandits any day. If you're a smoker, try Skull Bandits. Take a pouch instead of a puff. We're going to consider now the sport of biathlon, that unusual combination of cross-country skiing and shooting. And before you just nod and say, okay, it's, it's unusual, think about it. These men cross-country ski through the forest, up and down hills, more than 12 miles, and four times during that skiing, they're required to stop and shoot at a target. Now think about that. Your arms, after skiing like that and pulling, have to be quivering and shaking, your hands the same way. The temperature, 21 degrees, and suddenly have to become rock steady and become a sharpshooter. To do this, they've actually learned how to lower their pulse rate. They really have, and that's done through a, some form of sports psychology. You and I can learn something about that psychology and also about that sport as we watch this piece. We asked some other people if they knew what it was. Hello? Don't know. Never heard of it. Sounds like a fancy trapeze. Is there something to do with the biceps? Is it a movie? Like a premiere show or something? I would say people that are interested in natural happenings, bio meaning life, and uh, people that are interested in really getting into it and making kind of a marathon of it. Scientific? Something about outer space? Well, it's essentially a biathlon would mean it's uh, two, two events, I think, isn't it? Uh, you have to be uh, bisexual in order to enter that event. Basketball? Is it, is it similar to cricket? Is it similar to baseball? Football? Not racquetball, but um, can't get the name of it. They play it in Jersey. That's an Olympic event comprising cross-country skiing and marksmanship. Skiing and shooting. Something you can use every day. Skiing and shooting at the same time? Whoa. Is it? Oh, that's it probably be won by Russian. Well, the Russians could win it. They've won 11 out of 14 biathlons in Olympic competition so far. And biathlon does sound like one of those dreadful machines in your doctor's office. But what it is, is a sport requiring two different kinds of physical and mental agility and a very special kind of athlete. Like Olympic, biathlon is a Greek word. It means two tests, and they are cross-country skiing and rifle marksmanship. The challenge to the biathlete is to go all out on the heart-pounding pace of cross-country ski racing, and then have the quiet control needed for accuracy on the rifle range. Today, the 20-kilometer biathlon was held. Now, the 20-kilometer course, that's about 12 miles, is skied in five segments, interspersed by four rounds of shooting. After the final round of shooting, there's a two and a half kilometer sprint to the finish line. Now it may sound as confusing as Middle East politics, but it's really quite simple. The shooting rounds alternate from the prone position to the standing. In the prone position, the targets are four and a half centimeters in diameter, about two inches wide. The firing distance is 50 meters, about 62 yards. Each athlete is allowed five bullets to hit five targets in each round. In the standing position, the same rules prevail except that the targets are a little more than twice as large. Each missed target imposes a one-minute penalty, which is added to the skier's total time. Weather is more important to the biathlete than to the cross-country skier because of wind that can affect the marksmanship aspect. Today, the weather on the Ingman Plateau did not present ideal conditions. The blizzard that struck the Balkan Peninsula yesterday was not yet through dispersing its whiteness, and the wind was blowing at 12 miles per hour as the competition began. It was 21 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, getting in and out of the firing range is crucial in biathlon. And here is my colleague, Jack Turner, a former member of the United States ski team from Park City, Utah, with a look at range procedure. The approach to the firing range is really a critical part of this race. 
because they've been out there giving it all in the cross-country portion. Their heart's going fast, they're breathing hard, but now they've got to slow down for a precise skill, the marksmanship. And there's two ways that they accomplish this. One is they're in very good condition, so that naturally they tend to recover faster than you and I would. The other way is they actually practice psychological skills. They will their body to slow down, take it easy so that they have a steady hand, and they can shoot well. And to tell you more about the physical and mental preparation for a sport of such diverse activities is Dr. Barbara Colony with the first in a series of special reports on sports psychology. If you think altered stage just refers to a movie, or that controlling one's heart rate and respiration are only concerns of the mystics of the Far East, you might be surprised to see what our biathletes are up to nowadays. By going into uncharted mental territories, they're learning to control their physical performances. In the biathlon, an athlete is required to change directly from skiing, which is extremely strenuous, to rifle shooting, which requires total calm and relaxation. This switch from skier to shooter is difficult for the biathlete because it requires slowing down physiological responses. The first Olympic sports psychologist developed a technique to help biathletes make that switch. This technique of patterned breathing enabled one biathlete to calm down and reduce his heart rate between his first and his last shot. Between those shots, he reduced his heart rate by 60 beats in a period of only 30 seconds. Various breathing techniques that reduce their pulse, along with heart rate monitoring, continue to be an important part of their training program. But now they've taken this a step further. This year they're learning to control their mental states by altering their levels of consciousness. Here at the Olympic Training Center at Lake Placid, New York, Coach Marie Alkire explains what altered states have to do with biathlon performance. We're using the altered states of consciousness to move us from an ordinary level of concentration into a, a more vivid area of concentration in which we're calm, collected, controlled, in which you're aware of all the externals and yet can concentrate through the things that don't particularly pertain to exactly what you're doing at that moment of firing the shot. And just how does one go about altering consciousness? In your mind's eye, see a very huge inverted triangle structure. This is our biathlon team in a hypnotic trance an altered state induced by psychologist Dr. Marie Dalloway. When in an altered state, Dr. Dalloway believes more brain cells are being used, which increases the athlete's levels of awareness and enables them to concentrate more intensely. While shifting into a new state, they experience various sensations, muscle tremors, a change in speech patterns, and electrical changes in the brain can be monitored on a voltage meter. Another characteristic very often is a change in subjective estimate of time passage. This can either go in the direction of people feeling a sense of speeding up in time or slowing down in time. For our biathletes, that enables them to perform as if in slow motion, to shoot more accurately, eliminating the anxiety they feel when racing against the clock. Another characteristic, especially in more dramatic shifts in state of consciousness, can be a change or alteration in the feeling of who you are, the eye of identity. You actually leave your old familiar sense of self and move to a sense of self which is relatively new for most people. You begin your mental set to convert yourself from I the skier to I am a, a shooter, I'm a good shooter. Your breathing becomes mechanical so that you can lower your pulse and, and you start thinking about the shooting that's coming up. We'll be back for a biathlon competition. We'll also see more of the beautiful ice dancing right after a sports update and a word from your local station. A sports update brought to you by Budweiser Light Beer. Now from ABC News in New York, Bill Fleming. Good evening. 
In sports other than the winter games, college basketball today produced no major surprises. It was a close contest most of the way, but in the second half, Notre Dame simply couldn't tackle the task of toppling DePaul from its number two ranking. Brigham Young trailed by only three points at halftime, but Bill Martin stole the show in the second half, lifting number three ranked Georgetown to a 16-point victory. Now this. If you just ask for a light beer... And I'll have a light. You never know what you'll get. A Bud Light! A Bud Light. Because everything else is just a light. Olympic action continues in Sarajevo, Yugoslavia. The United States hockey team played Norway to a disappointing 3-3 tie, which means the United States team cannot advance to the medal rounds. And after 54 holes at the Hawaiian Open, Wayne Levy leads by three strokes at 15 under par. More later on the ABC News Weekend Report. Monday, February 20th, a spectacular three-hour network first, Superman 2. Investing like great music takes a range of instruments and the expertise to use the right ones at the right time. That's why the experts at First Texas offer money market certificates with a wide range of terms and high interest rates. So, First Texas can help orchestrate your financial future. Listen to the experts. Get this special First Texas bonus now. Hey, Bart, hurry up and get that old TV antenna fixed. Put that in there and this and here and this and here and that and over there. 24 Action News is about to come on, Vern. 24 Action News. We've got the people, we've got the news. Know what I mean, Vern? 24 Action News has got it all. They got your health watch. They got you Wednesday's child. They got you crime stoppers, know what I mean? Burn! Burn it up! Burn! This is 24, your Olympic station. <laughs> This is the gold medal winner from Lake Placid in 1980, East Germany's Frank Ulrich, on his way to a fifth place finish in today's 20 kilometer biathlon. And here is Jim Wood of Great Britain, not particularly renowned for their biathletes, but Jim Wood finished 14th. And then there was Senior Carrasso from that biathlon power of Costa Rica. He would finish last today, but finish he did. Now, number 31 here is Eric Cavalfos. He's approaching the firing range. Uh, what do we know about him, Jack Turner? Well, he's a Norwegian, and, you know, he gets the chance to ski with a lot of good racers and good coaches. And if you disregard the penalties, he skied this race about 20, 30 seconds slower than the winner of yesterday's special cross-country race. And, and you have to consider this, too. He's carrying a 10-pound rifle uh, around that track, and he's got a slow end coming in and going out of the firing range. And once again, we see how tremendously important the change into the shooting is in this sport. Yeah, it really is. And this is a, just the type of athlete that could use the help with the psychological skills that Dr. Colonnay talked about. All this snow and wind today isn't helping their concentration any either, is it? No, and I think it probably really hurts a racer like this because uh, he has the hardest time with the marksmanship. He missed five shots today. And if he would have shot the same score as the winner, he would have taken the gold medal. And if he would have hit just one more target, he would have taken a silver instead of a bronze. And there he is. He missed that last one. But here he comes down the home stretch to the finish line. And Eric Cavallos, a student from Oslo, gets the bronze medal in the 20-kilometer biathlon. I think he's got to be happy with that. Now at the start, we're looking at uh, East Germany's Frank Peter Roach. I think that it's really hard for me to describe this skier. He's a, he's a good cross-country skier. He's a, a good marksman, but he's not one of those people that really excels at either event. He just is a kind of a steady Eddie hangs in there, and I think it paid off for him today. He missed, uh, I think he missed three targets. He got all of them there, so he did well in that round. Yes, you're right. He, he missed three, but look how nicely he gets out of the range, and it's yeah. a pretty little tough place here. It's uphill right after they shoot, isn't it? Yeah, he didn't waste any time at all. He started skiing. He didn't stop to put on his poles. He really wasted very little time, and, and that's really important. Don't waste time. And he came in to win the silver medal a minute and a half behind the winner. I'll tell you, he barely escaped with it. It's a good thing the Norwegian didn't shoot better. This is the face of Peter Unger of West Germany, and he is truly a world-class biathlete. He really is, and 
he's in the German military with the Border Patrol. And you know, he just happens to be an instructor of marksmanship and cross-country skiing. I think that probably helps his biathlon training. I would think so. He's a pretty good skier, too, isn't he? Look. Yeah, he is. And you know, look at the track. It's kind of getting washed out. It's difficult, and he's tired there. So he is a good skier. And now approaching the crucial part, approaching this uh, firing range. Let's see his technique here. How is it? Uh, this is really a strong point. He only missed two shots today. He's seen Nod there. His coach is giving some instructions about the wind or how he shot the last time. But now that he's getting down there and ready to shoot, you could uh, blow a foghorn off back there. He wouldn't even hear it. He's total concentration on those targets. You know, in a race this long, too, this is really hard to be consistent. Now, all the time we have watched him here, his heartbeat has slowed down, hasn't it? It really has. Some of these guys have trained so well that they can actually time the shot to come between heartbeats so the gun is as steady as possible. That's one. Just squeezing it off so well, isn't it? Right, and, and something else, he's very quick here. Other athletes take a lot of time to get relaxed. He comes in, very efficient movements. Every time he comes in this range, it's the exact same set of movements. Very quick, very efficient. Look how quickly he gets up. Perfect score, and look at him out on the track already. Right. He's in and out faster than anybody else. But this is what really carries his, his racing, is his shooting. He'll be right out of there, he knows he's doing well, he just has to... Straight on into the finish. Peter Unger. It was his day. He won the gold medal, the first one for West Germany in the Winter Games since 1976. His time, one hour, 11 minutes, 52.7 seconds. Jack, he doesn't even look like he's breathing hard. He's a good athlete. Peter Unger. This is Lyle Nelson of the United States. He had the best American finish, 26th. And he berated himself later for acting, as he said, like a rookie, especially in the shooting phase. Yes, but you know, Lyle is the best biathlete the U.S. has ever had. He's been on this circuit for years, and regardless of how he does today, all these guys out there really respect him. Well, like our football coaches, those mostly nervous, but occasionally stoic figures, biathlon coaches live on the sidelines, too, and exhort and plead and chastise their charges. It's an international brotherhood of frustration, and no matter the nationality, the language is the same. Whether it be the ice blue Finns, or the white cross of Switzerland, or the United States of America, or even the natty insouciance of the Austrians. And the phlegmatic signals of the Swedes, or the stolid visage of the Russians crispness of the British. Or the wild open enthusiasm of the Australians who are so very far from home. By Athlon coaches live and die on the sidelines. Nordic Tom Landry, powerless to correct even the most simple mistake. Like going into the wrong house. Or falling upstairs. So, you and I both know a good deal more than we did a few minutes ago about the sport of biathlon. In just a minute or so, we're going to be going back to the ice dancing. Compulsory dances, first of three phases of that beautiful sport. Behind me, an interesting sight. This is downtown in the Old Town right now, late on Saturday night. No snow falling. And as for the forecast, they tell us it's excellent for tomorrow morning. Looks like we should finally get that men's downhill race in. As for the snow conditions earlier today, it was a little bit different. Up on Mount Trebevich, where they did hold the bobsledding, you can see the wind whipping the flags up there. But on top of Bielaznitsa, it was a lot stronger than this, if you can imagine it. Winds were blowing at some 115 miles per hour. It was, it was really just desperate. There was no way you could get any ski racing in today. As for the rest of the country, well, first of all, I guess I should say people you have here, any relatives and friends, are perfectly safe. The hotels are warm. People have been wandering around to the restaurants and the shops. It is no problem, except that the Alpine ski races were canceled. However, 
Rescue teams and troops have evacuated some 10,000 people trapped in trains, buses, and cars in the country. In the worst hit area, those are provinces north and east of Belgrade. Winds reaching 120 miles per hour cause snow drifts that block air, rail, and road traffic all around the Yugoslav capital. Cut off villages only 30 miles outside Belgrade. There were power failures all over the place. Uh, the army was out digging into the early morning hours to reach people stranded in snowbound vehicles on the main road from Belgrade to Zagreb. A town south of uh, Belgrade was cut off for more than two days because of snowdrifts 60 inches deep that blocked roads. So as you can see, this storm has been no joke. It may be moving out by tomorrow. We certainly hope so. And ice dancing coming your way. Gramp, I'm here to help you install your garage door opener. <laughs> I did it myself, son. It's a Stanley. Hey, Dad. Thanks for the garage door opener. I'll show you how to put it up. Oh, we, we did it this morning. The Stanley. Yeah. Oh. Harry. Oh, happy birthday, dear. You did it yourself. Uh -huh. It's, it's a, a Stanley. Stanley, we want to help you do things right. Get this Olympic sports bag when you buy any Stanley you install opener. It's free. Back in the Zetra Arena now for the second of the three compulsory dances which make up 30% of the scoring in the ice dancing competition. After the first of the three dances, the leaders are the gold medal favorites, Jane Torval and Christopher Dean of Great Britain. Besta Mianova and Bukin of the Soviet Union are in second place. Judy Blumberg and Michael Siebert of the United States are in third. With me again, of course, Peggy Fleming and Dick Button. First Peggy in the first compulsory dance, though it is difficult to continue piling superlative on top of superlative for Torval and Dean. They were everything we were expecting. They were great. And they're wonderful. They're in a class by themselves, and I think the marks that they've been receiving have been clearly showing that. But our couple of Bloomberg and Siebert have been skating very well. They're in third place, and there's a big chance of them staying up there and getting a medal for us. Okay, so only one dance down now. That accounted for 10% of the final score. That was the Paso Doble. And now we will see the second of the three dances, which is the rumba. Dick Button, what to expect from this one? Well, this dance is, like, is almost like a two-headed uh, force coming through. In the first place, it's very decorous and very straight up and, and kind of, uh, uh, you know, controlled dance. But yet underlying all of it, as all rumbas have, there is a primitive charm that is a primitive seduction that is going on through the movement and the steps. And although it's on the surface very upright, there's this very sexy kind of quality that goes underneath it all. And the, the steps that illustrate this are very wide, swinging, deep edges, open chalk doors and closed chalk doors, and wonderful kind of swinging moves that you just see that kind of sexy quality going on underneath it all. It's terrific. And as the draw would have it, the first to skate the rumba will be the leaders, Jane Torval and Christopher Dean. And it's important to remember about this dance that it has a double standard. In the first place, there is very much a seductive, primitive feeling that comes out of the faces of the dance, but yet on the surface, it must be smooth and decorous. And the second most important thing out of it all is the rumba motion that exists throughout the whole dance, that they must achieve that kind of a beat. It's a three, four, one, two beat rather than uh, a regular standard beat. And the entire charm is gotten through these steps right here, the wide stepping moves. See them there? The chalk doors, the back stretch, the forward wide stretch again. The double three dip that they do right there. And the strength of Torval and Dean is the speed and the power and yet the control that they have of this entire dance. One other thing that's very unusual about Torval and Dean is that you tend to look at, at Christopher Dean a lot when they're dancing. Usually the man is more of the background, but in this couple you do look at both of them and, and Christopher. They're, they're just wonderful to, um, to watch. Their unison and their uh, ability to, to dance on that beat.
That is it. The second of the three compulsory dances, the rumba, as skated by Jane Torval and Christopher Dean. And now let's look back in slow motion at some of the footwork. And watch how closely they are together. Look at the extension of that leg is right together in this back edge. If, if the judges could have a telephoto run, this is how closely they would be looking at the steps. What's important is what they're doing down there. They're all doing the basic steps, but on the upper body is the expression. And now here are the judges' marks. 5-9, five, 5-9, nine, five, nine, five, nine, five, nine, all the way to the Czechoslovakian judges 5-8 and the American judge at 5-8. Nearly impeccable. And now Judy Bloomberg and Michael Siebert in third place after the first compulsory dance. Michael is still recovering from a bout with mononucleosis, which he suffered during the fall. Earlier, Donna Deverona spoke to both Michael and Judy about that and more. How did you feel about your performance at the national championships? Did you, do you feel it made you ready for this? Are you confident coming in? Oh, God, it definitely helped us for this. It was strong for that period in time. We had trained it uh, a matter of a week and a half, and we did what we had to do at nationals. It was very important for us to be there. I think what it did was it was because I had been sick, because I hadn't been skating, um, it pushed that level of competition and then once we got there we started to compete and realized re-realized what what that feeling is all about and that's good because then you you start to feed off of, of off of that competitiveness and that competitive edge that you gain how do you feel you i feel fine now i feel absolutely fine <laughs> now for nationals i wasn't feeling well i really didn't feel strong i didn't feel confident but we we skated well and consistent and was we very pleased with the results but now I feel good Michael now that you feel you had your mononucleosis under control I understand that before you came to Sarajevo in practice you pulled a groin muscle is it something to worry about like Randy Gardner during the 1980 Olympics is it a big injury or is it just a sore muscle um, I'm okay it was not wonderful yesterday mm -hmm and we skipped to practice because of it. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really okay today, and I skated this morning, and that's fine. The, the, hardest, the hardest part for me is the free dance. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're just sort of, because it's still early in the week, mm -hmm. I mean, the best thing for any sort of that it's type rest. of injury is rest. And so we are taking it easy now, mm -hmm. easier than what we would normally do. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have the time to do it, so we're taking that time making sure that it's okay. So we will keep a watchful eye on Michael Siebert throughout the competition. Though he contends that if the groin injury is to begin bothering him, it is unlikely to do so in the compulsory dances. Remember what to look for in the rumba. It's a long, slow, sexy kind of dance with constant repetition. Look at this marvelous start that they're getting. And remember, there's one long sequence down the ring of wide-stepping chop doors. Right here, we see them start. Now, which wide step? Swing, wide step. Now, look at this chop door right there. Again, a wide step, a forward swing of motion. Double threes, and that's the end of the first swing of the dance. Now, it's repeated going up to the second side of the arena. But what Michael and Judy are known for is that constant flow, that wonderful long line, and the deep edges. Both skaters in the exact same position, doing the exact same steps for the entire of the dance. These moves right here, wide stepping open chalk doors, closed chalk doors. There you see it. Look at that. Yeah. Well, they look like they're having fun, and that is certainly part of it. Really marvelous performance. You know, they, they have such a fleet line. They're so lean and clean and long and thin that it's marvelous to see.
Okay, let's take a look at their uh, feet and some of these moves that they're doing. Look how close they're going. And those deep edges, very nice timing. And that togetherness that the, the judges are constantly looking for. Skillfully done, and the scores are very good. Five, 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 seven, five, six, five, 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 seven, five, six, five, seven. Owens Corning Insulation gives you two ways to be a winner in the winter game. Score impressive fuel savings when you buy 10 rolls of Owens Corning fiberglass insulation. And get a free pair of Converse training shoes. The official athletic shoe of the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. See your participating insulation dealer before February 26th. And be a winner in the winter game. New typewriter, Miss Tompkins. New typewriter, but I've got an IBM typewriter. You, Miss Tompkins, eighth floor? But I love my IBM. I depend on it. Ah, but this one's got pages of memory and it can be upgraded. But, but nothing else has the IBM touch. Get somebody else that typewriter. But this is an IBM, a new electronic IBM typewriter. It takes an IBM typewriter to replace an IBM typewriter. The most preferred typewriter there is. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Summer Olympic hopefuls are in the spotlight with powerful performances. Anatoly Fizarenko is among the super heavyweights who pump for glory in the World Weightlifting Championship. Plus, the best women gymnasts compete, including world all-around champion and Soviet sensation Natalia Yurchenko, America's Julianne McNamara, and many more in the Women's World Individual Gymnastics Championships. A strong day of action tomorrow following the 14th Winter Olympic Games on ABC. Now here is what ranks at the moment as the third, the three Soviet couples in the competition, Olga Bolajinskaya, Alexander Spinin. After finishing fourth at the World Championships a year ago, they currently rank seventh in this competition. You can already see the speed that they lead into this with. I think this dance really shows off their particular style because they are very tall people for skaters and these long lines, these wide steps look even better because of that extension of their leg and the length of their leg. You can see the beat of the dance, the way the dancers step on the 3-4 part of the measure, rather than right on the beginning of it. It's very much an off-beat kind of quality. There it is. Like hold, step. Hold, step. Terrific dance, isn't it? Yes, it's wonderful. Volozhinskaya and Spinin of the Soviet Union. Now, look, look here at the way they look over their left shoulder and the right leg, the free legs just swing out behind. There it is right here. Now, look right there, step wide. Top, open. Isn't that beautiful, the lining? The forward, just wide steps swinging there. Very, very difficult, and the quality of the music is very unusual. The marks, 5254, 5250, 5035253, 48 from the Canadian judge and the American judge. 24-year-old Natalia Beskimanova and 26-year-old Andre Bukin of the Soviet Union are in second place coming into this compulsory dance. Here she's already gotten carried away with her style, too. They are a wonderful couple. Notice that little extra kick of the foot there, the bending in, something that they add to this dance. I think it's their, their philosophy of dancing that is 
something is good, something more is even better. Here's the quality of the dance right here. Wide, stretched legs, swinging moves. Open and closed top doors, double threes. Always the dancers remaining in the same position relative to each other. And keeping the speed up in this dance with all these deep edges, when you do deep edges, it does slow you down a bit, but to keep that flow going is what's important, and the judges are looking at that too. That's Timyanova and Buchan. A year ago at the World Championships, they edged Lumberg and Siebert of the United States for second place by the margin of one judge's mark. There are those wide steps. Look at the stretch that comes out. Now, this dance is particularly important in seeing whether they will maintain their lead over Blumberg and Siebert. You've already seen the very strong marks which Michael and Judy received. Now, here are their marks, 5-7, 5-8, 5-7, 5-4, 5-7, 5-7, 5-6, 5-7, 5-5 from the American judge. And now, Marina Klimova and Sergei Panamarenko of the Soviet Union. They are in fourth place, coming into this dance. Now look at the way she forces your attention onto her. Look at the total speed of the movement in the head and the shoulders that she achieves. Now look at the turn and the twist of the head, the upright look. Very much her dance. That rumba motion, most important, rumba beat. couple finished fourth at the European Championships two years ago when she, Klimova, was only 15 years old. Okay, watch their expressions. This is where you can express is with the upper body. Everybody is doing the same moves, but her face really sells this dance. The toss of the head, the facial expression, the marks, five, six, five, seven, five, 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 three from the British judge. Five, 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 four, five, 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 four, and five, four from the Canadian and American judges. Chevy Thompson is taking charge with three things a Chevy S10 long bed 4x4 offers that Ford Ranger doesn't. Like shift on the go instant track four-wheel drive, like available Delco Bilstein gas shocks. Plus, S10 long bed has a box almost five inches longer and wider than Ford Ranger. These three bikes won't fit in a Ford like this. Tough Chevy S10, the real king of the hill in long bed pickups. Chevrolet, official U.S. cars and trucks of the 1984 Winter Olympics. Traveling with the Olympic team, you don't always get the, a chance to uh, set your meals at a certain time during the day. You. you just through the hard work and everything it takes to get ready, you're just naturally going to be hungry. And uh, with snack foods such as Snickers, you know, you can satisfy that hunger. Packed with fresh peanuts, peanut butter nougat, caramel, and milk chocolate. You. Packed with peanuts, Snickers really satisfies. The Snickers bar uh, certainly works for me. Official snack food of the 1984 Winter Olympics. Budweiser salutes the coaches and trainers of the 1984 right, U.S. Olympic good team. And a good follow-through. Please, Judy, fight it hard. Don't let me catch you. Don't let me catch you. a couple runs in the back. A run is it off. That should give you a little bit quicker time to the game. That's so good, Jerry. We'll get him tomorrow. Good, good extension. Head up. To the U.S. Olympic coaches and trainers, the team behind the team, this Bud's for you. 
Now, Lisa Spitz and Scott Gregory of the United States off to a good start in 10th place. Their first Olympics. She's only 20 years old. They have an enormous amount of charm on the ice. They almost seem to be very energetic and you might say American in the way they approach the rhythm of this dance. Yeah, it's very different than Michael and Judy, who are national champions. She almost slipped there. I know, and that kind of thing in this dance is extremely dangerous. Any slip at all is, has a tendency to be heavily marked down by the judges. It was subtle, but certainly the judges saw it. to root for them regardless of nationality scott is so friendly and gregarious she has many of the same qualities they're fun people obviously very very difficult these dance steps they're so tight and so close look right there you can see where their skates are hitting and what caused that slight stumble now it's also very lucky for them that they didn't go down at that point that was the lucky part of that but it did cost them in the scores. 4-9, 5-1, 5-1, 5-1, 5-2, 4-8, 5-1, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 
Doesn't it almost look like Bride's Head revisited as though they're about to step out into the marble floored ballroom, have a wonderful dance to the tune of the, the music stretching out from behind the staircase. up of the uh, intricate footwork that they do have to do in this dance. I like their outfits, Peggy. That they too nice? is a part of the overall impression. Terrific looking tuxedo, Richard Dallas. And now a closer look at the footwork. And look how close they are skating together in that unison of the legs and the feet. These judges are looking for all those edges. Very nice. Goes without saying, years of hard work, countless hours of practice to build toward that. And now the scores: five two, five one, five three, five five from the British judge, five three, five one, five two, four nine from the Canadian judge, five four from the American judge. Here, along with so many others, to enjoy the competition with us, the Hollywood actor so respected and so accomplished, Kirk Douglas. Many other celebrities passing through Sarajevo for these winter games. And now the standings after the second compulsory dance. The leaders remain Torvald Dean of Great Britain, Bestemianova and Bukin of the Soviet Union remain second, Blumberg and Siebert of the United States third, Fox and Daly of the United States sixth, Spitz and Gregory are tenth. We're going to be going back to Zetra Arena a little bit later on for the third of the three compulsory dances in ice dancing. We're also going to be seeing Women's Luge from Mount Trebevich. It is really a wild and exciting sport at any time, and the women had particularly unexpected events. I think you're going to enjoy it and find it most interesting. We're going to have two views on, well, the subject of the day, really, the failure of the United States Olympic ice hockey team. What went wrong? What was the trouble? What in the world happened? One view from the very disappointed coach of that team, Lou Vero. Another from our commentator here, the captain of Team USA in 1980, Michael Ruzioni also combined ski jumping after this message and a word from your local stations do you know me i beat him in the movie chariots of fire you didn't meet me well i beat the chap who played you mind you i couldn't beat your gold medals in the 20 and 24 <laughs> olympics <laughs> Hey, what happened to the check? The American Express card, that's what happened to it. You're still pretty fast, aren't you? <laughs> to apply for the card, look for an application and take one. The American Express card. I know. Don't leave home without it. With the majesty of the winds of war and the forbidden desires of the thorn birds, ABC presents Lace. Innocence ends where Lace begins, February 26th. You know, Austin's been our home since 1977. The Southwest brought us low fares and somehow kept them low. From here, we fly the cities throughout the Southwest and back home again. They made flying possible when I thought I couldn't afford it. We just wanted to bring low fares and good service to a great city. And besides, they treat me like family. And besides, we can use the money. The higher the goal, the tougher the preparation. Perfection demands dedication, pride, and practice. When you put it all together, you know you're a winner. For you and the high goals you've set, only the very best will do. For over 100 years, we've placed our reputation on your table. Enriched buttercrust bread. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, tonight at 11.30 on 24.
Tonight's coverage of the 14th Winter Olympic Games is brought to you by Owens Corning Fiberglass, makers of pink attic blanket insulation. By Budweiser, proud sponsor of the U.S. Olympic team. For all you do, this Bud's for you. And by Kellogg's Corn Flakes, crispy, crunchy flakes of corn, a delicious sway to start your morning. This is the view an Olympic luger has of the Mount Trebevic luge course. It unfolds slowly at first as the sled gathers speed, its polished runners darting over the ice below. Faster now, fighting the G-forces in the high bank, now flickering through combination turns that come at you like the jabs of a prize fighter. Strength and a love for speed. A man's game? Sure. But in the Olympics, it's also a sport for women. Indeed, the format for the women's competition is exactly the same as the men's. This was the scene on the first day of competition. The snow sweeping across the course, limiting visibility. The track turned treacherous. Yesterday, conditions were, if anything, worse. As the winds increased, there were times when the spectators could barely see the course. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the participants? dominated in the past few years by the women from East Germany. This is Uta Weiss, 22 years old. Here she goes through the loser's ritual of envisioning the run ahead, curve by curve, preparing herself for the hundreds of decisions that must be made in the seconds ahead. Bettina Schmidt, 23. At 190 pounds, she's the heaviest woman competing in the Winter Games. She won the European Championships in 1982. This is Steffi Martin, 21 years old, leader after the first two runs. It's easy to sense that here is a woman who is excellent at her sport, not only because of her skills and fitness, but because she genuinely loves what she does. So that's a look at the three East German women that have been the top contenders in this competition so far. And remember, at this point, two runs are complete. We have two runs yet to go. Hi, I'm Sam Posey, and working with me in the sport of women's luge is Jeff Tucker, himself an Olympic luger, four years ago in Lake Placid. Jeff, you've seen the East German women in action over and over again. Do you think there's any chance at all that they can be beaten here? Uh, the only way they're going to be beaten here, Sam, is if they beat themselves. I don't think anybody can dislodge them from one, two, three. It's going to take a mistake on their part to, to, to lose it. Uh, of course, we have a bright spot out here with Bonnie Warner, the top American woman. She's currently in eighth after two runs, uh, not very far out of fifth place. And I talked to her this morning. She was excited. She was pumped up for the race. And I think she might get as high as fifth. She's really sliding well. I'm excited about that. All right. Well, we have that to look forward to as the third run is about to unfold. With the competition exactly half over, two of the four runs complete, the current order in women's luge is Steffi Martin first, Bettina Schmidt, second, Uta Weiss, third. These three women are all from East Germany. Soviet women are fourth and fifth, and in eighth place is America's Bonnie Warner. This is the scene right now in the women's start house. That's Yumiko Kato of Japan about to start down the run. Of course, her coach holding that towel in front of her face, hoping to keep the snow off that face shield right until the last moment. Nico Kato, born curiously in Sapporo, Japan, of course, home of the Winter Olympics in 72. Jeff, gee, <laughs> that was about the most gentle push-off I've ever seen. I think all that did, Sam, was get the sled rolling. She obviously is intimidated by the track and doesn't want to go too fast today. But her form doesn't look bad, actually. She's, uh, her head's back, her toes are pointed, and she's riding fairly smoothly. Uh, 
better than usual, Sam. All right, Yumiko Kato, and of course, you know, the thing when you say slow, she's going 60, 65 miles an hour there, so it's not slow in real terms, only relative terms. In a sport where everything is measured in tiny fractions of a second, here she comes. No! Yumiko Kato! Oh, my... That wow. was a rough crash, Sam. That was a very rough crash. She was bouncing around. Her sled was bouncing around. Uh, it looks like she's going to finish, though. Yep, she's in the finish turn now. She's headed for the finish line. That is really something she is determined to finish with her sled, as the rules require. Yumiko Kato, what a way to end the run. Uh, Sam, we see her here in turn nine. She's got a good line, but watch as she comes out, the left leg comes off, she stops steering completely. There's no steering going whatsoever. She's in a skid, going through 10, rolls right off the end of curve 10, and is over going to 11, where we pick her up here, upside down, sled bouncing around, hitting her all over, the very violent in there, very violent. I hope she came through that one okay. Uh, and wow. Uh, that's and she's back on the sled in the finish curve, though. It looks like she's riding a Cresta, uh, she's going to make it through the light. Not yeah. a stylish finish, but uh, certainly a brave one. All right, on that note, we'll be right back. If you're poor in Kellogg's Court Place, you've earned a special place on the front of America's favorite cereal. Sit down to a familiar face. The face of a Kellogg's Court Place lover. The face of America, too. There are certain names that stand out in the world of sports. And there's one place where you can find them all. The Sports Center at Kmart. The greatest names in sports at a Kmart price. Perhaps that's why Kmart sells more sporting equipment than anyone else. We're back at Mount Trebevich for the competition in women's luge. A matter of moments ago, this was the scene here as heavy winds swept across the track. A forbidding sight, especially if you were a loser waiting for your turn to race. But this is what Trebevich looked like before this winter storm blew in here three days ago. You can see how little the mountain was marred by the creation of this magnificent course. It was designed by a Yugoslavian engineer who hunted up here as a boy and didn't want to see the mountain spoiled. The track is roughly 4,000 feet long. The vertical drop from start to finish over 400 feet. There's the women's start house just vanishing on the right. The men's start house ahead there. It's quite a beautiful thing, almost a sculpture. All right, now at the starting point in the women's start house, that is Steffi Martin, leader at the end of the first run, the first day of competition, leader at the end of the second day of competition. She's from East Germany, and Jeff, she just is the favorite, no question about it. That's absolutely right, Sam. It doesn't look like anybody can beat her. She just goes out there, and without any fan for anything, she just gets out, and she's the fastest one every single run. She's really remarkable. In other words, if you were going to say, this is the way to do it, everybody, this is the person, the model that you would pick out. Absolutely. Steffi Martin and all the East German women have really redefined the sport of women's luge. Uh, they've just raised it to another plateau. Where they do everything a little bit better than the other women, and it shows in their end times. One, two, three in the standings. All right, well, we just saw her split time from the top. She's two-tenths of a second ahead already. So that's an indication of just how powerfully she pulls off there at the start and how beautiful her technique is at the beginning. Here's the finish curve. She was that quick down there, and frankly, a surprise to no one. Steffi Martin takes the lead. Another one of her patented runs. Jeff, they're almost all the same in terms of time. She is just, it seems to me, unbeatable. And Sam, the great thing about Steffi is she really enjoys it. She seems to enjoy racing. She has a good time, and she's got a really great character. She's always smiling and just having a wonderful time out there. <laughs> and, of course, she's very powerful. You know, those sleds weigh almost 50 pounds. Here at the top, putting herself almost into a trance to envision the course ahead there, Bettina Schmidt, uh, also of East Germany, Steffi Martin's teammate, the 
Woman currently lying second in the competition. She was second at the end of the first day, second at the end of the second day. She is the woman that we heard, referred to earlier as the heaviest woman in the Winter Olympics. You see her there, an enormous woman and extremely powerful. And she, she has an amazing technique off the start. Not anywhere nearly as lithe and strong as Steffi, and yet when you start to see the times come up, you realize how effective Bettina Schmidt is. And Sam, you really shouldn't overplay the weight because she still has to drive that sled down the run. Even though she's 190 pounds, that gives her a lot of speed. She drives beautiful lines, and at 65, 70 miles an hour, she maintains a perfect aerodynamic position on that sled. Okay. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. And there, her time is excellent. In fact, it's just behind Steffi Martin. Bettina Schmidt working on a very good one now, going into those bank turns and now into the labyrinth. And these German women, again and again, seem to come down this run like they were on rails. I mean, they never have a problem. They just nail it curve after curve. And there she is, moving <laughs> with the wave, moving into second place behind Steffi Martin. No big surprises there. Bettina Schmidt, incredibly capable, as, as I just can't get over these East German women. They seem to just have a marvelous knowledge of this whole business. And again, of course, she just hefts that sled as if it was nothing. Back at the top of the run, this is Vera Zazulia of the Soviet Union. She was the gold medal winner in Lake Placid. She came into this competition here, the Olympic competition this year, thought to be perhaps the only woman that could break into the East German domination. She started the competition by finishing fourth on the first day. She backed that up with another fourth place run yesterday. And now she's on the course again. Jeff, like all the Soviets, of course, she's superbly conditioned, uh, prepared mentally. But something is lacking there between her abilities or whatever and the East Germans. What could it be? Uh, I'm sure the Russian women are, are wondering that as well. Their coaches are probably confused. They seem to do all the same things. Powerful start, good sleds, good forms. But the East German women are with that little bit ahead. And I think it's driving them crazy, Sam. <laughs> Somehow in this sport, with just the smallest fractions of things count for so much, they just are coming up that little tiny bit short. Now she is currently in third, but there is still one member of the East German team, Uta Weiss, yet to run. When it comes to sawing and cutting, or ripping and tracing, and scrolling and shaping, and clamping and holding, and drilling, and routing, and carving, and sanding, come to Kmart for the complete line of quality Black & Decker products. Black & Decker at Kmart, from start to finish. Kmart, we've got it, and we've got it good. You're about to see a few people learn to use one of the newest, most advanced business computers in the world. The computer for the rest of us. There are certain names that stand out in the world of sports. And there's one place where you can find them all. The Sports Center at Kmart. The greatest names in sports at a Kmart price. Perhaps that's why Kmart sells more sporting equipment than anyone else. begins as a dream, a vision of Olympic glory reserved for the very few. A dream that will bring the fleet and the strong to Los Angeles in 1984. And Transamerica Insurance and Transamerica Occidental Life will support these dreams by ensuring the Olympic Games. Because our business is ensuring people's dreams. Transamerica Insurance, Finance, Manufacturing, Transportation, Innovation. The power of the pyramid is working for you. Well, there's Bonnie Warner. She's going to make her next run very soon. She looks remarkably relaxed there as she chats with Paul Dondero, who's a reserve for the U.S. team. All right, on the course right now, this is Susan Rossi. This is the wife of Ron Rossi, who is one of the 
doubles team members for the American team. Susan Rossi, a Canadian, uh, making a very good start, Jeff. Uh, Sam, she looks pretty good coming down the run. She's had some problems in some of her earlier runs, but she looks like she's doing very well today. She's more relaxed on the sled, and the form's a little better. All right, when you say relax, you mean in spite of the speed and everything that you must do, the idea is to keep your body sort of pressing down like a shock absorber onto the sled, isn't it? But not stiff, Sam. That's the key thing. you got to remain loose. All right, here she comes. She seems to be taking driving. Oh, good line. She went over. Sam, through the finish curve, she's upside down, going backwards. Those are totally disorienting. You don't know which way's up. And those are the frightening crashes, let me tell you. Oh, boy, I just hope she's all right. And I hope her husband, if he was watching, didn't happen to be watching from this part of the course. Well, the Labyrinth has claimed another victim. And anticipating this possibility, Jeff, you took a closer look at it even before the event began. I'm here in the Labyrinth, a series of free link curves, none of which are very big. It doesn't appear to be a difficult section of the track, but at this point, racers are up to 75 miles an hour. And with the curves coming after each other so quickly, they have to make split-second decisions as to steering and positioning on the track. A mistake in one of the early curves is going to give them all kinds of problems further down. Here is Bonnie Warner. She's about to make her run. This is one very bright, energetic, multi-talented woman, as my colleague Dick Schaap discovered. She is a bright enough student to be admitted to Stanford University as an engineering major. She is a gifted enough goalie to be a candidate for the Olympic field hockey team. She is a skilled enough camera woman to be considering a professional career. She is a 21-year-old Californian named Bonnie Warner, and she is clearly a born winner, but she is not a born loser. No one is. I'd never heard of the sport in, until 1980. I'm from California, and uh, I was a torchbearer during the 1980 games, and I just saw it while I was there in Lake Placid. And so, well, right after the games, this torchbearer came up to me and said, oh, come do this luge camp. I said, what's luge? And she said, oh, you know, it's one of the sports. It was the only sport I didn't see during the Olympics. The daughter of a man who manages appropriately a jet propulsion lab, Bonnie Warner's rise in the luge has been rocket-like. She finished seventh in the World Championships last year, but has no illusions about winning a medal here in Sarajevo. If I had a very, very good race, a few other people messed up, I'd probably end up about six, somewhere top ten. But a medal would, is pretty much out of the question for, for this game. However, you, know, you, never can, you never can tell. I mean, you can't race that out of your mind. Bonnie Warner is obviously a sensible and articulate young woman. And what is she doing going 70 miles an hour downhill on ice, lying flat on her back on a sled that is almost invisible? Everybody who watches the sport, unless they are a loser themselves, thinks they're crazy. There's something about it. it maybe it just looks like we're insane daredevil type people. But uh, t the daredevils tend not to do as well. You know, you have to be a very sane person, a very calm, cool, collected. If you're, you know, a schizo, you're not going to make it down the track. You're going to crash. And uh, no. Everybody thinks I'm crazy, but I know I'm not. Bonnie has herself and Sarajevo under control, comfortable in the dining room of the Olympic Village or on the streets of the old city. But as soon as the Olympics end, she will hurry back to Stanford to resume her studies and her field hockey career. Bonnie Warner would like to represent the United States again in 1988 in the Summer Games, an unprecedented double for a woman. From Sarajevo to Seoul, Dick Schaap for ABC Sports. Bonnie Warner, it's still snowing as she prepares now to make her run. She was eighth at the end of the first run, eighth again at the end of the second run. Jeff, this is really where she wanted to be. I mean, of course, she hoped to do better, but this was her realistic assessment of what she could do here in these Olympics. And she's riding right now, sliding up to her expectations. As you mentioned, she's done very well. Uh, there are only two Western Europeans ahead of her, and I think she can catch both of them, Sam. Let's watch her start. Look at that. Very, very, very fine start, Sam. She got out of there a powerful stroke and a very good paddle. 
and uh, she's riding very well, very smoothly on the upper part of the course. She's putting her head back a little further than she usually does. Uh, she thinks she might be losing time to some of the other girls up top because of aerodynamics. Well, you know, you speak of her attitude, but she was down at our ABC Center last night looking at videotape footage of her run from yesterday. So, I mean, she, she has a very technical orientation. She knows what she's looking for. She spoke of finding some techniques. We'll see if she can put them into action now. Attention to detail is one of her big strengths, Sam. All right, well, she's working just going there into those bank turns and into the labyrinth. No! She's come off the sled. This is the finish turn. She's riding the finish turn. That's the line there. Bonnie Warner has yes. crashed. Absolute disaster for her, Sam. She's just going to be bitterly disappointed. Uh, I mean, just... Look at that. That's incredible. She has to be completely shattered, Sam. She was doing so well. She was so fired up about this race. Uh, it's part of the sport, though. You're doing well, and the next thing you know, it's all over. She had a dream, and it, it shattered now. Now, I wonder how she is. Well, she's able to move all right. Bonnie Warner just crushed by what has happened there. We obviously uh, hope that she isn't hurt. Jeff, have another look at it. What happened? Well, Sam, she just got into the curve way early. She hit it way early. It flipped her right over. And coming out at 12, she was already upside down. She tried to get it back together but she was off the sled, going into the finish curve, fighting all the way through, a very gallant effort to get back on that sled, but she was just being thrown around, and at 65 miles an hour, uh, sometimes it doesn't matter what you do. You're Whoa. just in for a ride. But Sam, that's a legal finish. She's hanging onto her sled. She crosses the light with her sled, but what a disappointment. It's going to put her back, way back in the standings. Well, I just hope she isn't hurt. She's there with the American team manager, Bob Hughes. I see them walking together, obviously. And here or there, a very disappointed woman. Bonnie Warner and a shattered dream. Oh, it's a great joke, too. <laughs> 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 no, good sure? jokes. They were great. All right, back up to the top of the run. This is the third member of the juggernaut that is the East German team. You are looking at Uta Weiss third after the first run, third after the second. Of course, her two teammates, Bettina Schmidt in second place overall, Steffi Martin in first. You see Uta Weiss concentrating there. If she has any hope of moving up into a silver medal, it better be with this run now. Uta Weiss pulling her visor down. Still snowing heavily here, Jeff. I know you've told me it doesn't affect the visibility for the participants. I. As a neophyte to all this, I still just find that hard to believe. Well, Sam, the point of focus is only 20 to 40 feet ahead of you, and uh, the visibility is less than that. They'll stop the race. But that was the classic East German start there, uh, powered right out, and you see the heads all the way back, feet are pointed, and they just let the sled run in the top because they know that's where the speed's got to be made if you're going to get a good finish time. All right, well, we'll watch the clocks there to see. She's got to beat the time of Steffi Martin over the top part of the course. The upper split is, well, just a little bit off, but then that's the way it's been going in this sport. It's always just by little tiny hairs of time that seem to make the difference between winning and losing. But like all the other East German women, she's coming down this track like she's on rails. Not a single mistake, and another hot time for an East German woman, 41.793, and that's going to lock up third place for her today. There's a certain predictability to it that in some ways is absolutely fascinating. So, with just one run left to go, in first place, Steffi Martin. Bettina Schmidt is second, Uta Weiss third. Bonnie Warner, eighth coming into today, has dropped all the way back to 16th as a result of that crash. One other footnote about Bonnie Warner. When she was in Lake Placid after being a torchbearer, she took a job as a waitress in a Lake Placid restaurant. Somebody had a contest, $5,000 first prize. Write an essay on how you would use the money to try to become the best in the world at something. She won the first prize, took the $5,000, came to Europe to train with the best, and came back a pretty darn good loser. Tough break for her today. Well, very shortly here, we're going to have our first ski jumping of these Olympics. It was postponed yesterday. They had it today. It's the 70-meter jump of the Nordic Combine after a news brief and a word from your local stations.
and ABC News Brief, brought to you by Budweiser Light Beer. Now from Washington, Max Robinson. Good evening. President Reagan hinted today that he's willing to attend a summit meeting with whomever replaces Yuri Andropov as leader of the Soviet Union. Thousands filed past Andropov's body as it lay in state in Moscow today. No word yet on who's likely to succeed him. The first U.S. citizens evacuated from Beirut arrived safely in Cyprus today as the Greens flew out the last 400 American civilians fleeing the city. The evacuation was, however, interrupted by sniper fire. And the Space Shuttle Challenger made a picture-perfect landing today, the first ever in Florida. Now this. If you just ask for a light beer... Uh, give me a light. You never know what you'll get. Bud Light. Bud Light. Because everything else is just a light. Nine days before Iowa's caucuses, Democratic presidential candidates debated in Des Moines, blasting President Reagan and frontrunner Walter Mondale. More later on the weekend report. Is the pressure to grow up faster destroying our children? Monday on ABC's World News Tonight. Settle down, son. Yes, we have our telephone. But it's not a toy. This is a very sensitive instrument. There's a special way to operate it. I can't wait to tell Tommy Flanagan we got one. For today's new independent Southwestern Bell Telephone Company, the challenge hasn't changed to continue bringing you the best phone service in the world. Looking back, we can only be more encouraged about what lies ahead. This is 24 KVUE TV, Austin. Another full hour of Olympics coverage coming up right now. Behind me, son of a gun, darn if it hasn't started snowing again. Right now, we're going to get our first look at ski jumping in these Olympic Games. The ski jump in the Nordic combined from the 70-meter jump. Here's Keith Jackson, his expert, Jay Rand. Intermittent snow and wind troublesome all day at Valopalio for the Nordic combined jumping competition. The standings after two rounds... Mueller of West Germany leads, Mitten and Finland second, Anderson of Norway third, and the Americans, Pat Ahern 12, and Kerry Lynch 20th. It's been one fall in the jumping so far. Drago Vidic, a Yugoslavian here, fell in the first round, suffering a mild concussion and bruises, though weather was not the only factor in that fall. Both the first and second rounds were stopped and restarted by the jumping jury, each time jumpers going beyond the critical point into a dangerous landing area. The jury is shortening the end run to slow them and reduce distance, each time, Americans suffered losses and points. Pat Ahern, for example, lost more than eight points in the first round rejump alone. And now into the third round we go with a good one, Sergei Cherivayakov of the Soviet Union. He is in ninth spot after two jumps. He's a tough jumper, and if he runs well, he could be in good contention for an overall victory. And it looked like he had a long jump there. He picked his knees up at the end, but he's going to have some good distance points. He's liable to be the new leader. He jumped 88 meters, and the points, 1048 for him. That gives him 210.3 total and puts him at the top of the scoreboard. Now, this is Pat Ahern of Breckenridge, Colorado, in 12th place, and Pat surely must be thinking the sky is about to fall on him because he has had nothing but trouble all day. He lost heavily in points in both of the rejumps. He could have been leading this jumping competition after the first two rounds had they not been in the rejump situation. But right now, Pat Ahern needs the jump of his life to move back into contention. It's going to be tough for Pat. Psychologically, after a good jump like that, it's just hard to do it again. He had a nice ride, good landing, but he's a little short. 81 meters. Bad in style points, only 91.6, 195.1 his total. He'll be well back. So it's been a tough day for Pat Ahern of Breckenridge, Colorado. And right there, it looked like he dropped down a little too low, caused him to come up. He didn't get on the air quick enough. He lost a little airspeed, and he was a little behind. He should have been over his skis more. 
And it'll be a hard day for Pat Ahern to forget. You can't shrug it off. Thomas Muller now, West Germany, leader after two jumps. He needs a solid effort here to retake the lead from the Soviet jumper, Sergei Trevayakov. He's a strong jumper, and if he can combine his running skills with that, he could do well. And there's a nice jump. Long one. 87 meters, 1022. Total points, 2091. He's in second place behind the Soviet jumper. Disappointed as he looks back up the mountain at the scoreboard, another look. He really drove quickly into the air. The ski tips came up well, and he just rolled it over, floating down the hill using the air currents, and goes into a nice steady landing. So Muller is in second place as we turn next to Tom Sandberg of Norway in fifth spot, and this man had big profits from the second round rejumps. A lot of people rate him the man to beat, but he had to have the luck of the rejump to put him in the position that he's in right now. Tom Sandberg. Timing looked good, and he's driving it way down. Beautiful landing. He's going to love that one. Long jump, 88 meters. That will be worth 1058. Gives him 214.7 points, and he now takes the lead. As he approaches the end run, you can see the forward compression and the snap at the knees. Powerful, smooth, and there he rolls it over. Aerodynamically, it's excellent. And a beautiful landing. Tom Sandberg of Norway, now in the lead at 214.7. Next, we'll have a look at Kerry Lynch of the United States. And this is the man who also was burned in that second round rejump decision. There were only four jumpers to go when the jury stopped them. So instead of Kerry Lynch, who was in the blocks, ready to go, instead of letting him be the first man in the rejump, the jury restarted from the top of the order, which is exactly opposite of what they did in the first round rejump. So Lynch had to come down. He waited for more than a half an hour before he could go back up the tower and get his jump. He is now in 21st place as he goes for his third jump of the day. Psychologically, this is going to be very difficult for Kerry after waiting all that time. It looked like he brought his chest up on the takeoff, and he did have a bit of a problem controlling his skis. 79 meters, but bad, bad, bad on style points. 85.9 points. Total for Kerry Lynch, 181.8, and that will drop him farther back in the rankings. So there are your final results of the Nordic combined jumping. They've got 1,500 meter cross country coming up. Here's Jay Rand with Kerry Lynch. Kerry, it's been kind of a tough day. You must be very disappointed with your jumping. Yeah, well, technically I thought I was doing things right. Uh, as you can see, you know, it um, seems like every time we get a good, good rhythm going or something like that, somebody would exceed the critical point and have to start the round over. Um, which great gave inspiration for guys like, uh, you know, Tom Sandberg and, you know, people like that be, that weren't jumping so good at, at the beginning. They, they, they liked it and they kept going. But other people, you know, like myself, I got cut off the first time I had a couple guys before me. And then the next round, I had uh, one guy, the uh, guy that started before me, um, exceeded the critical point. And it just blows your concentration. We had to walk down, get back into it. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it was one of those things you have to just keep trying to, to work for. But, you know, it, it's, it's really, that, that's the rules and it's not fair, but, you know, the wind, this is a wind hill. We had crazy wind today. You know, the guy that went 92 meters went back up and went 72. And he's a great jumper. He just, he told me he had uh, about the same uh, takeoff as when he went 92. He just got hit from the side. And when you do that, you either fall on your side or you have to come down. So. You know, just a crazy day. I'm kind of surprised. I thought Kerry Lynch might even be angrier than that. Now let's turn to Jim Page, the U.S. Nordic Program Director. Jim, it appears that a jury decision has affected the entire outcome of the jumping today. Yeah, Jay, I'm, I'm so frustrated. I guess I'm halfway between ang anger and tears. Uh, I hate to see politics enter into sport, but it obviously did today. I don't think that the, the jury, which is composed of five members, made a conscious decision to take a medal away from the Americans, but in effect, that's what they did. And I think what happened is they saw an opportunity, the, the uh, people on the jury to help their own country after some of their athletes had had a bad jump. It's real terrible. 
bit of controversy up there on the hill. Now remember, that was the Nordic combined jumping. Tomorrow, they ski 15 kilometers cross country. At the same time, the specialist ski jumpers will take over that hill. We'll see more ski jumping, the 70 meter special ski jumpers. So that's the story for this moment. We're gonna have a lot more coming up on the rest of this night's program. motion every day. Delta is ready when you are. That's a big step, Tom. I'm still gonna go to college, Dad, but after the Army. I thought you wanted to be an electrical engineer. I'll be learning about electronics. Then I can qualify for the Army College Fund. If you qualify, the Army College Fund will help you accumulate as much as $20,100 for tuition. So you're gonna be a soldier? Be all that you can engineer you can do it be a good one in the army america's meat and potatoes mcdonald's quarter pounder and fries your work work working up an appetite you're a meat and potatoes guy looking forward to when you can start working on a quarter pounder for the boy America's meat and potatoes, McDonald's quarter pounder and fries. Dig in. McDonald's and you. When AT&T wrote the book on quality control, a lot of people read it. In fact, they studied it. Today, some of the most quality conscious companies in the world use the AT&T handbook as a guide. The fact that so many companies depend on us for quality means a lot. The fact that so many people do means even more. AT&T, we're reaching out in new directions. TV's lovingest game show is back as Jim Lang hosts a Valentine week of daytime special. She never told me it'd be so much fun. Uh, it's different. <laughs> Such a hassle. Uh, hassle. Watch the all-new newlywed game all next week at 11.10 Central and Pacific. Well, John Denver is still very much with our ABC team here in Sarajevo. As you know, he's kind of our troubadour slash reporter. He was a little combination of both this time. He went to a music school here in Sarajevo. When he went there, he learned a little something, and, well, he taught the kids a little something, too. Sarajevo has many schools which feature a very fine music program. I had the pleasure of visiting one of these schools where some young people sang for me a song which is currently the most popular record in Yugoslavia. I was told that they were familiar with some of my songs. I just had to check it out. Country Road. Country Road. Take me home. Take me home. To the place. I belong. I belong. West Virginia. West Virginia. Mountain Mama. Mountain Mama. Take me home. Take me home. Country road. Country road. And here we go. Almost heaven. West Virginia. Blue Ridge Mountain. Shenandoah River. Life is old then. Older than the trees, younger than the mountains, growing like a breeze. Country road, take me home to the place I belong. West Virginia, mountain my life. Take me home, country road. All my memories gather round her, mine is lady, stranger to blue water, dark and dusty, painted on the sky, misty taste of moonshine, teardrops in my eyes, country roads, take me home, to the place. Mama, take me home, 
Next two differing views on what went wrong with the American hockey team here in Sarajevo. Chevrolet taking charge. Coming at you, one hot selling wagon from Chevrolet, the front drive Cavalier. Hot. Cavalier's two liter electronically fuel injected engine delivers more standard horsepower than Ford Escort and the three leading imports. Hot. Plus, Cavalier Wagon has more total room and a cool, low price. Chevrolet, official U.S. cars and trucks of the 1984 Winter Olympics. Smile, Beatrice. So special. Family time. Beatrice. Friendly day. Beatrice. Beatrice. Sharing. You've known us in so many ways. Tomorrow we're gonna be there too with Beatrice Knowing us You've grown with us with Beatrice Beatrice You've known us all along Yeah, Beatrice You might not recognize our name Beatrice. But chances are you've enjoyed our products for years Beatrice And we stand behind every one Which might be the reason we've been around so long Beatrice And a pretty good reason to remember our name With Beatrice You've known us all along. Beatrice. Well, now we're going to tackle the subject of the United States hockey team. As you know, it's all over for them now, but it wasn't when this day began. If they had beaten Norway and then Finland had beaten Canada, their hopes still would have been alive, but it didn't happen. We want to find out what happened, what went wrong, but first of all, let's see what happened in that game. They were playing Norway, heavy favorites to do so, well, here's Al Michaels. Coach Lou Vero tried a different tack today as he went with a new goaltender. It was Bob Mason in the Nets replacing Mark Barron for the United States. And Jorn Goldstein was the Norwegian goaltender. And what a day he had. Norway got the scoring started at the 11.31 mark of the first period. Bjorn's scorer's shot was initially saved by Mason. But the rebound was put in by Arnett Bergson to make it one to nothing. However, the Americans got even at the 15-15 mark. It was Scott Fusco in over the blue line to Paul Gay, who put it in to tie it at 1-1. And then Pat LaFontaine, who had been the U.S.'s top scorer during the pre-Olympic schedule, scored his first goal of the Olympic tournament at the 1807 mark. The first period ended with the United States leading Norway 2-1. The U.S. needing a victory to stay alive for medal round contention. Then, Aga Ellingson scored at the 237 mark as he beats Bob Mason in the second period to tie the game 2-2. The U.S. had its chances in the second period. Here on a three-on-one, it's Pat LaFontaine stopped on a fine save by Goldstein, and the second period ended with the score tied 2-2. Then, simultaneous penalties to Scott Bugstad and David H. Jensen in the third period created a five-on-three situation. And Norway was able to capitalize on this goal by Gare Mira to make it 3-2. Again, 
Little chance for Mason as he was screened. And the Norwegians, who had beaten the U.S. only once ever in international competition, had the lead. But the U.S. was able to get even here on this goal by Ed Olchek at the 9.23 mark of the third period. The Americans then put the pressure on and late in the game with less than two minutes to go it was David A. Jensen stopped again foiled on that great save by Goldstein and that's the way it ended the United States three Norway three a game in which most people figured the United States win would win by seven or eight goals a very frustrated and dejected Lou Vero looked on as the U.S. was mathematically eliminated from medal round contention at that point. Lou, very much appreciate your coming here, especially under these circumstances. Uh, two losses and a tie against Norway in the first three games. What's gone wrong with the team? Well, I don't know, Al. Uh, we came in here with high expectations and high hopes. It's a very good team. Uh, we certainly haven't performed up to the level of abilities that we had all year long in 65 games of preparation. If I could pinpoint it, I guess we would, if any of us could pinpoint it, we'd do something about it. Uh, We've tried everything, and uh, I hate to use excuses. I'd like to say the opposition just played very well, which they did in all three games. But I, I, I do think that if there's ever been a case of some bad bounces and uh, just hard luck, this team is, has seen it. Uh, the players have really worked hard and tried hard. I mean, they've come to every game to win and, and to do their very best. And it seems the harder we work and the more we try, uh, nothing seems to fall into place. But what about the burden, uh, when you think of it now, the burden of following uh, the 80 team, arguably the greatest sports story in American history. Was the burden just too much? Not in a conscious uh, manner. I don't think it was. But I think that feeling in the dressing room, I'm trying to identify it, and I think it was fear of not succeeding. And I think uh, those expectations put on this hockey team by the world, not just by Americans. And, uh, I mean, the Czechs, uh, Soviets, many different hockey teams and hockey people here have told me that they heard great things about our team, that we're really a good team, and they really expected a lot from our team. They're all asking me now when they see me, what happened? Well, you know, that's not the team we heard or stories we've heard about your team. Uh, I think subconsciously it did affect them, and I think that's the feeling that was in that dressing room that I'm just trying to identify and, and analyze and then, of course, that quick goal 27 seconds into the first game did not help our confidence and probably put all kinds of internal pressure on, on the team and on the individual players. But I can assure you that they're emotional. I've been with them after the two tough losses in uh, today's game, and they're very emotional. They feel very bad. Every hockey coach would dream of, of coaching an Olympic team. You were selected. You had the toughest of acts to follow, obviously. Your emotions, what do you feel inwardly right now? Well, I feel uh, disappointed. Uh, after the Canadian game, I also felt uh, almost humiliated or embarrassed, like I let the world down, let, let our country down. And the thing that changed that was the uh, numerous telegrams and response from strangers that we, I've never met in my life. People have sent uh, beautiful telegrams to our team, hundreds of them, and they're all supportive. And uh, now my biggest concern is, is the team, how they feel, they're devastated in some ways, but they'll, they'll bounce back because they're, they're young and they got great futures ahead of them. But uh, there's a great amount of responsibility that went with participating in this program on this team, not just the players but, and, and the staff, but everybody, right to the equipment men who work very hard for us. And everybody feels uh, disappointed right now. We're not going to hang our head down low. We're going to go out in the next two games and play as well as we can and do the best job we can. And uh, we got to support our players, and, and I think some of them are almost afraid to go home. So I hope the people back home respect that these kids have given everything they can for this team and, and for their country, and it uh, just hasn't worked out, and that's sports. You can only have, you know, you can only have uh, one winner. Like a uh, guy said to me in an interview the other day, he said, Lou, how does it feel to be a failure? A fair question. I thought it was a fair question. I said to him, well, I said, let me answer it this way. Uh, I don't feel I'm a failure, and I don't feel this team is. You mean to tell me that the only successful coach in, a, in, in pro professional hockey is Al Arbor, or the only good team is the New York Islanders? The other 20 teams aren't any good, or the other 20 coaches aren't any good? I said, I don't buy that. You can only have one winner. You can only do your very best, and you can still have a great program, and you can still be proud of, of your people. 
Well, Coach Vero said there that some of the kids are afraid to go home. Who would have thought that the hockey story for the USA in these Olympics could have ended that way? But it has, pretty much. I'm sitting now with the captain of Team USA of 1980, with Michael Ruzzioni, authors of The Miracle of Lake Placid. Mike, you've followed this team since they were selected last summer. It's a team that won a series from a very good Russian select team. Uh, they've beaten National Hockey League teams. They've come here and look like they're hypnotized or under a spell. What happened? Oh, I <laughs> wish I knew. <laughs> if I did, I'd get on and tell Coach Vero, but I don't know. They, it's, you know, when you analyze the situation and you look at the three games that they played, um, the game that they played against the Canadians was probably the worst game that they had played all season long. And, and I'm not, I don't mean to take anything away from the Canadians, because the Canadians played very well. Uh, you look at the game against the Czechoslovakian team. They just don't have the horses that they have. The, the Czechoslovakian team has much more talent. And they played a per perfect game. And I think even if we played the best we could possibly play, we couldn't beat them that night. Does the Norwegian team have an equal amount of talent? And now, here's the next game is, is a, a game like that against Norway. And, um, you know, I, I made an analogy today during the game that a good college team should beat Norway. Um, maybe it's unfair to say that about the team, but uh, they did not play well today. They ran into a hot goaltender, but still, their talent is so much better than the Norwegians that they should have won the game. Uh, Herb always told us that you don't win on talent alone. And uh, today, they, they went out and tried to, to win on talent. The talent wasn't there. They didn't have the emotion that goes along with, with games like that, that they had to have. And you've always been very big on the emotional side of sport and of hockey. Uh, when people ask you what was the extra dimension that made it, made it possible for you guys to play better right. than you were capable of playing, you say, quite honestly, it's because we loved each other, things like that. Why didn't they have the emotion? Where could they have gotten it from? I don't and know. where did they lose it? They, they obviously didn't bring it with them. Um, they left it home for some reason. Uh, I talked to John Harrington and Phil Recoder about it, and, and he said that they, they, they just were so nervous and so uptight that they couldn't let their emotions out. That everything was bottled up inside them. Um, I, I believe the key to our team was that, was our emotion, was our character, was our love, was our respect that we had for each other as athletes. And I think these, this team had that, but yet they were just so nervous, they were so uptight, they couldn't let it flow, they couldn't let it show. And I think, in essence, that would, that's what happened to them. I think the question has to be asked, Mike, what kind of a job do you think Coach Vero did? Uh, it's easy to be a it, Monday morning Yeah, quarterback. no question it is. In, in this situation, question. it's probably easy to be because they're coming off... Uh, a gold medal and, and people expected them uh, to be a good team. I mean, everybody that watched them play this year's season in the National Hockey League games, in the exhibition games, said they were as good and maybe better than the 1980 team. So I think everybody expected them to do real well. The kind of job that Lou Vero did, I think as a coach, I think he prepared his team very well. I think he did a fine job uh, of selecting the best players, but I think what he lacked and what he didn't do very well was prepare them emotionally. and. Uh, uh, John Harrington said that a lot of that does depend on the players, but when the players don't respond, I think that's his job to step in. Uh, again, though, I, I feel he did a good job of coaching the team, but in the Olympic Games, uh, one-shot deal, emotion is a big, big factor, and it's a new experience for Lou and a new experience for a lot of the players, especially the younger players. So if you were to grade him on something like that, I would guess you'd say that the, he didn't prepare him emotionally. Okay, thank you very much. Michael Ruzzioni, captain of Team USA 1980. Now, the United States was eliminated, but there was another big game tonight, Canada against Finland. And Canada was down on its luck for a while, trailing Finland by 2-1 to one early in the third period. But watch now, you'll see number 14, Darren Lowe, take a pass from Kirk Muller and tie the score at 2-2. Two to two. So the Canadians have tied it, and five minutes later, Kerry Wilson feeds Craig Redman at the blue line. Redman now will drill the puck past the Finnish goaltender, Kerry Taco, giving Canada the lead, and it turned out to be for good at 3-2. to two. But they weren't quite finished at 14.01 of the third period. You'll see number 19, Dave Gagne, down by the crease, take that pass in front of the net, convert that spectacular goal, giving Canada a 4-2 victory, thus putting Finland's quest for a medal in serious jeopardy. So Finland is in trouble now. The United States is out of it, unfortunately, as far as a medal is concerned. They have two more routine games to play. The Norway game this morning, in the end, did not matter because Finland would have to have beat Canada for the U.S. still to have a chance. Okay, we're going to have more ice dancing, the final one coming up. Want to clear out a room full of guys in a hurry? 
try this. The Shadow from Honda. People want to listen to it. People want to look at it. And everybody wants to ride it. The Shadow from Honda. Now you know who's in charge. Anatoly Fizarenko is among the super heavyweights who pump for glory in the World Weightlifting Championships. Tomorrow on ABC's Wide World of Sports. This is 24 News Brief, brought to you by Brake Check. Good evening, I'm Wendy Rutledge. Tonight, officials in Brownsville have recalculated today's cocaine bust to total well over $60 million worth of the drug. This morning's raid was the biggest in all of Texas history. In part two of her series on Texas women in law enforcement, Judy Maggio looks at how women officers are sharpening up their shooting skills. Now this. We help you ride, ride. for these stories and more coming up at 10. You could spend all your free time analyzing your investment options. You could spend a small fortune on books, research, and financial guides. And even after you make your decisions, your investments don't take care of themselves. And now's the time to talk to First City. We can develop an organized plan for your financial growth and then help manage your investments so you can spend less time worrying about your money and more time enjoying it. First City, reaching further, doing more. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, tonight at 11.30 on 24. Well, we're a long way from Detroit, but there's plenty of representation from America here in the Zetra Arena as we ready ourselves for the third and final compulsory dance in the first phase of the ice dancing competition. After two of the three compulsory dances, the leaders are Jane Torval and Christopher Dean of Great Britain, the favorites to win the gold medal here. Bestemianova and Bukin of the Soviet Union are second. The American medal hopes Judy Blumberg and Michael Siebert are in third place. Again, working with me, both of our expert commentators in figure skating, Dick Button and Peggy Fleming. And Peggy, it seems to me, perhaps I'm misled, that in ice dancing, even more than in the other disciplines of figure skating, it is difficult beyond this point in the competition to move up in the standings. I noticed that in our national championships in Salt Lake City a few weeks ago, the one through 13 placings remained the same all the way through the compulsory dances, the original set pattern, and the free dance. Is it likely that anyone can move up in the standings beyond this third compulsory dance? Well, I think it is. Uh, these are just like the compulsory school figures that are in single skating, and any little mistake can cost you a, a whole lot. But there's, you know, two other phases of the competition that are going to be coming later. And anything can happen in competition. You can't, there's nothing that is really a for sure thing. So any one of these people could move up or that could stay the same just as it did at the National. The one thing that is regarded as almost a sure thing here is that Torval and Dean will win the gold medal. We'll be watching them again now as they go into this third dance. We've seen the Paso Doble and the Rumba before. Now the Westminster Waltz. Dick, what is it like? Well, the, West, the Westminster Waltz is really a very stately dance. It progresses beautifully. There's a lot of soft knee energy in the dances, but not soft knee energy that has this kind of a bounce that handles it. It's a very even-paced and dignified dance. It's almost as if we were seeing these couples in the rotunda of a great Greek revival mansion in the Old South. It's, uh, for me, a very romantic dance. The first couple we'll see, runners up in the last two world championships, second in both of the two compulsory dances so far here, Natalia Bestemianova and Andrei Bukin of the Soviet Union. And these are their opening preparatory steps, not part of the formality of the dance until we get to this point right here. And all of a sudden we see the one, two, three, swing on the inside edge and hear the first of the great loads that make up this dance. Great sweeping movements that circle the eyes lovely kind of extensions that create the waltz kind of quality of it. Here we see two turns facing each other and again deep sweeping moves as they come back down the other side of the ice. One pattern takes the couple all the way around the ice. Here he turns, she turns, and now watch him pass her in front of him. And now they're ready to start the dance over. I think one of the things that makes this couple look so stunning on the ice and makes this dance look so good is she's 5'7", and he's 
And I think that when they do a move like this, those long edges and it stretch the free leg, it just emphasized that much more. and almost hysterical in the repetition of their movements. In this dance, very elegant, smooth, and quiet. On paper, there is not a large competitive difference between this couple and the current third place couple, Judy Blumberg and Michael Siebert of the United States. So, for both of those couples, each move is significant and important as the competition goes along. Destinyanova and Bukin of the Soviet Union. Okay, now let's take a slow motion look. Look at the extension on the leg. Because of their height, it just emphasizes that movement that much more. And these deep edges. And the arm movements are only their only way of really interpreting this any differently than anybody else. They're doing the same moves. Now we wait the scores. One set of marks in compulsory dances. Five, 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 eight, five, seven, five, 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 seven, five, seven, five, 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 six, and five, five for the second place couple. Scott Gregory and Lisa Spitz will be skating very soon. Donna Deverona spoke to them earlier about their impressions of the great British couple, Torval and Dean. Well, they're like in a different league from us. This is our first Olympics. So we're just coming here and showing our material and just having a good time. Learning experience to watch them really is. They're incredible and we just watch to see what we can learn from their training. In what ways do you think they're incredible? Every way. They're just tra they're champions right through. Their flow, their extensions, their unison, their polish, expression, everything. their tricks. It's just amazing. You learn from it. You learn to be realistic in this sport when you're on the way up. Lisa Spitz and Scott Gregory have a long way to go before they reach the eminence of a Torval and Dean or even of their American teammates Judy Blumberg and Michael Siebert. But here they are, and they're on their way. They are in 10th place in the competition through the first two dances. Double swing, chalk door turn right there. And the swing mohawk, rocker turn. That double swing move, here it comes again, is actually a double swing counter rocker right there. He does a counter, she does a rocker. Those are the directions in which the skater turns. A lot of these compulsory dances are very similar to the compulsory school figures that one does in single skating. All the basic turns of threes, brackets, rockers. Fitz and Gregory were second in our American National Championships a year ago, slipped back to third this year. There's really quite a competitive balance between this couple and Fox and Daly, and why not? They train on the same rink in Wilmington, Delaware. Crowd has taken a liking to them. and vice versa. Okay, let's take a slow motion look at some of these really deep edges that they're doing. Those are an open mohawks right there. And that lean back. You count on your partner for that move. Nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. These marks are likely to disappoint the audience just a little bit, but they're very consistent. 5-0, five 5-1s across, another 5-0 from the Canadian judge, 5-1 again. What am I thinking to? We've got what it takes. We've got what it takes to make it easy. We've 
got what it takes to make it good. Then there's nothing you can't do when you know your true value. We've got what it takes, true value. The more you have to do, the more you really need true value hardware stores and home centers. We've got what it takes, true value. Sure. It's frightening. You come in one morning, you sit down at your desk, and you are staring at a computer screen. Hello. <laughs> You're looking at a piece of equipment you didn't know existed the day before. Did I want help? You bet I did. And I wanted that help long before that computer was plugged in and running. <laughs> Wang understood that. Wang, the office automation computer, people. Now the number two British couple, which skates in the shadow, of course, of Torval and Dean, Karen Barber and Nikki Slater. They are in fifth place in the competition after the first two dances. have changed costumes for this particular dance, I think, to reflect the waltz and the flowing moves that are here. facing at each other. And again, deep lobes here. One, two, three. Out. It's just very handsome. He turns. She turns. Now watch him pass her from the left to the right. And they prepare to start the dance over. in the world championships a year ago fifth here after two dances barber and slater of great britain you can see here how very lyrical and tightly yet tightly controlled these dances are look at the swing the pass through the legs the crossovers his turn now watch her turn now watch him together pull her right across and in front of him until she takes the lead Five four, five three, five three, five four, five four, five two, and five threes out. Now here the couple which have been runners up in ice dancing at the American National Championships in five of the past seven years at Carol Fox, 27 years old, hometown is Westland, Michigan. Her partner is Richard Daly, 26 years old, from Detroit. There's a great deal of enjoyment on their face. I think they really have extraordinary pleasure. You can see it in the lobes of the dance. turn and he passes her forward and now they're in a position ready to start the dance over and repeat it inside edge mohawk swing now a 
step and a turn and a double turn. Rocker counter move. Carol seems to finish off everything. The, watch her toe and the extension of actually both of their legs. It's, it's great. She looks so attractive on the ice. And you mentioned the sense of enjoyment at 26 and 27. This will likely be their one appearance in the Olympic Games the next week, and their lives will not be forgotten. Okay, let's take a closer look at some of their steps that they were doing. Look at the close extension. Look at that beautiful extension on that leg. It's wonderful. And the double turn here. And again, that extension. All these little details, that's what the judges are definitely looking for. Carol Fox and Richard Daly placed sixth in each of the first two compulsory dances. Here are the marks for the third. 5-2, five, 5-1, five, 5-4, five, 5-5 five, five from the British judge. 5-3, five, 5-2, three, 5-4, five, three, five, five, and 5-4. Five, and those are marks are much better for them than they've been getting so far. This may be a breakthrough for them to move up in some of the conditions of the dance. That's nice. Now here are the leaders, three-time world champions, Jane Torval and Christopher Dean of Great Britain. As you watch them, Keep in mind, they are regarded as the farthest advancement of the art of ice dancing so far. The judges look for timing, carriage, flow, unison, deep edges, and the character of the dance. They seem to give this dance a whole new look. They're just a class by themselves. They're are incredible. the unison in the legs. It's just perfect. to a layman like myself, what strikes me is that even though they're skating, I don't think you'll ever see the word dance better defined in action. Interesting right there, they do something totally different than any other dancer. They leave their feet in front the opposite of those at the end of those double turns counter rocker turns no other dancer does that wonderful swing and freedom and complete control over the dance they're marvelous to see speaks for itself jane torvald christopher dean from nottingham england regarded by many as the strongest gold medal favorites in these games Let's take a closer look at their fabulous feet. I mean, they are such in unison. Look at the extension on that. And they're right together. Well, they have made perfect sixes into a regularity in this sport, and they have them again. 6-0, from the Italian judge. Two more 5 nine. Three sixes on that dance. Congratulations. That was really That's the first time the six has been afforded in compulsory dances, is it not? I think the first time we've got one anyway in the championship like this. Is it getting a little bit too much, all these sixes? No, I like them. <laughs> you, I think you do. Congratulations, Chris. Thanks so much. What, what about all of this? What does it feel to you? Great. <laughs> is, is it just extraordinary pressure for you to be 
so far ahead and so much in the lead. And is that a problem for you? We don't think about it. The only thing that we want to do is give our best performance. And if we do that, we're very happy. People speak so much of you. Is it just become a problem that everybody is talking about you constantly? Does it ever let up for you? Well, we try to just sort of get on with what we're doing and enjoy ourselves and hope that the public enjoy what we're doing. So. Well, you look as though you do. You're yeah, terrific. Enjoy, yeah. <laughs> You're becoming great popular favorites in the United States, I will tell you. Thank you. Congratulations. So once again, Torval and Dean have established their preeminence in the sport. It's a tough act to follow. Michael Siebert and Dean. I admit it. I overdid it. I went that extra mile. For all you overdoers who push your bodies a bit too far, there's buffering. I admit it. I overdid it. I kicked like a cheerleader. Now I could kick myself. For all your minor aches and pains, there's Bufferin. Bufferin has aspirin, the pain reliever so many sports doctors recommend. Plus, it's buffered to help protect against aspirin stomach upset. I admit it. I overdid it. I didn't win. But I won't be a sore loser. Bufferin, for when you overdo. A welder becomes mysteriously ill. Then another. And another. But this business has Aetna life and casualty behind it. An Aetna environmental expert takes charge. A series of laboratory tests leads to a startling discovery. Vapors from a solvent heated by the welding produced a deadly gas. Aetna solved the mystery. The workers returned to work safely. No wonder fully one-third of America's largest businesses say... Aetna, I'm glad I met you. And now, Judy Blumberg and Michael Siebert of the United States, third place after the first two dances. We remind you, Michael Siebert recovering from a late fall bout with mononucleosis, also nursing a slight groin injury as he tries to get through this competition. This couple out of the three that are up in the top right now are very elegant, and this is is a kind of a dance that shows off their style the best. Their deep edges and their long, long legs that really extend and flow. There's a fleetness that this couple, along with the other two top couples, have that place them head and shoulders above every other dancer here. much has gone into this in a sport where most skaters stay and train at the same place for a long time. Michael and Judy have broken the mold. Been to London, Toronto, Europe, now in New York City. Tried differing styles to expand their repertoire and their technique. And now they finish the third and last of the compulsory dances as their bid for an Olympic medal continues. Judy Blumberg and Michael Siebert of the United States. Now watch their wonderful expressions. They really get into these moves. Watch that lean. And the head, everything is important to express these flowing moves that are in this dance. All a part of the presentation. You see the smile on Judy's face now. They have completed the compulsory dance phase. And these scores ensure that at the very least they will be in third place. 5-6, five, 5-5, five, 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 eight from the British judge. 5-7, five, 5-5, five, 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 six, five, six, and another 5-8 from the American judge. Dick Button is with them now. You are terrific. Thank you, Dick. Is that your dance? I think so. We were having a little bit of trouble with the ruts, though, tonight. It was, 
It wasn't as good as we'd like it to have been. Well, none of us could see that, but I mean, it looks like it's your style dance, your it quality. Is. I think it's a waltz, and we love waltz. Yeah, well, your, your long line makes it look, look perfect. How's your leg? Good. I mean, I have nothing on today. We're skating, and it's okay. We took it easy at the beginning of the week, and it's paid off. Good luck. Thank you. Thank We're you. working on it. So now the first phase of the ice dancing competition is complete. After the compulsory dances, Torval and Dean of Great Britain hold the lead. Estimianova and Bukin of the Soviet Union are second. Judy Blumberg and Michael Siebert of the United States remain third. Carol Fox and Richard Daly of the USA are sixth. Lisa Spitz and Scott Gregory are in tenth place. Judy and Michael's quest for a medal in this event will continue now in the next phase, the original set pattern, and then finally, in the part of the competition that counts for 50% of the final score, the free dance. Introducing technology is one thing. Making it easy to use is another. So at AT&T, we not only have people who know machines, but people who know people. A group of over 150 psychologists who test people's reactions to new products to find out what they're comfortable with and what they're not. You see, we believe even the most advanced technology is of little use if people are afraid of using it. AT&T, we're reaching out in new directions. Me and my brother started with one truck. He drove nights, I drove days. I'll tell you one thing we learned. You give a customer good service at a fair price, they'll stick with you. People who make Meister Brown beer must have learned the same thing. When I first tasted Meister Brau, I thought it tastes just as good as Budweiser. When I found out how much it costs, I thought it tasted even better. Gentlemen, the bar is open. <laughs> Introducing Meister Brau. Tastes as good as Budweiser at a better price. The finer things. Happily, some are affordable. Like Grey Poupon Dijon Mustard. Grey Poupon has the classic quality of the original French Dijon recipe created centuries ago. A distinctively delicious taste for meats, salad dressings, and sauces. So enjoy one of life's finer pleasures. Pardon, monsieur, est-ce que vous avez du Grey Poupon? Mais bien sûr, Grey Poupon, one of life's finer pleasures. Know what I have to charge you for every hour Joe works in your car? A lot of money. Right, Joe? <laughs> right. How long does it take to change an engine, Joe? Oh, a couple of days. How long does it take to...